A A A A B B B C C C C. I have no idea where she's going with this, but here we are. Cheers. All right. All right, ready? And three, two, one. Action! Action. Welcome, everyone, to episode three of the Hidden Pearls podcast. My name is Emma Kittle, and I am joined by the one and only Bruce Kittle. Today, we have quite the stacked lineup for y'all today. I'm very, very excited about everyone who is on, everyone who y'all get to meet. Um, first up, we have some special players on. So the 49ers are playing the New York Giants this week in New York City. Um, so we have Evan Ingram. We have Levine Toilolo. Special shout out to his wife, Stephanie Toilolo. Also, Claire Kittle makes an appearance later in the show. Uh, oh, Dini Kittle. Um, our, our budget is going out the roof. Oh my goodness! Right now. Oh crushed. my Holy goodness! Uh, we also have Eva's Village on. We have our very cool Eva's Village vest. Thank you so much for overnighting this to us. We Angela love them. and the staff there. Thank you. <laughs> They're so much. very very warm. We have the house set to like sixty five degrees yep. right now because Bruce and I were cooking up. And make sure to stay tuned for the end of the show. We have a super exciting surprise from GK himself. Uh, we get into the Ask George questions, and we also have a very, very special giveaway. Giveaway. Told y'all it was coming. Yep. Uh, this is even bigger than we thought it was. So, um. Yes, and uh, just as an oversight, so uh, Emma said whether we, the Niners are playing the Giants, and I just want to give a shout-out to the Giants uh, for all their help and support and working with us, and particularly Ethan Medley. Uh, who's in their community relations department, did a great job, super supportive, really helped us with all of this stuff. So we want to thank him and just all kinds of folks over at uh, Eva's Village. And we'll get into more of that later. But anyway, thank you to everybody who made this show possible. For sure. And later in the episode, you're going to meet uh, Angela and Chip from Eva's Village. So we're very excited. Um, all right. With that being said, let's roll right into our quote corner. Take it away, BK. All right. So quote corner, again, uh, just a quote of the week to just uh, maybe a little inspirational piece. So again, believe really strongly about the things that we think about guide us and the quotes this week are connected. So last week we talked about small steps consistently taken all in the same direction lead to amazing results. And so just get started, whether it's ugly or not. And uh, this week we're thinking about the mind and where our mind is and the mind creates the small steps that we take. So uh, first quote is from attributed to Buddha. The mind is everything. What you think you become. The mind is everything. What you think you become. Second one is from Bruce Lee, great martial arts uh, movie star and all that kind of stuff back in the day. So if you haven't read about him or heard about him, which I'm sure there's a generation of folks that haven't, but very worth reading. But anyway, um, his quote, as you think, so shall you become. So very similar. As you think, so you shall become. So um, just the principle there is basically that our reality is created through the projection of our mind. That is, we create our reality by the things that we think. So be very, very careful about what you do think. And so we always had, and uh, we talked about it before, that we had a big mirror down in our workout room. And on that, we had a variety of things, and I would always write up stuff. But one of the little catchphrases that we had is, see it, believe it, be it. And it's so true that you have to see it first. And so what you have in your mind, what you see, truly dictates the direction that you're going and what's going to happen in your life. So be very careful about that, but see it, believe it, and then be it. So Emma, thoughts on mind and so shall you become i love firstly yeah such solid yeah. quotes all the time yeah he's um tough. looks good with his shirt off too he's <laughs> tight ripped, fabulous ripped, yeah um i i just i love all of this because the idea of manifesting and creating your own reality i think as when you think about uh being in control of your life and i mean really we're not in control of shit Let's just be honest. I think the whole process of life is learning to accept and surrender. Um, but the thing that you can control is yourself and your energy and your intention and your emotions and your thoughts. And so if that's the one thing that we get to control in this life, control it into being and creating the life that you want to have and you want to live in. And I think that if, you know, we have so many different stimulants um, from social media to our family to our friends to podcasts right there are so many different influences on our lives and if we can think about and hone in on who we want to become and stay crystal clear and focused on that energy it's insane how fast you can manifest and create these shifts in your life so never ever uh, 
underestimate the power of your mind, underestimate the power of yourself, or underestimate the power of a clear intention and goal setting. Um, Bruce is the master whiteboarder. (laughs) I just, uh, for those of you who know us, who know our family, we love whiteboarding like when we all get pretty, together pretty visual yes like we are we are visual people yeah and yeah. so when we put a goal up and we put a message up and we put something on our mirror like that it's super important because we believe in the power of manifestation and using your mind and your energy to create what you want and yeah so and so most importantly and emma listed a bunch of stuff that we can control outside of us we can't but things within and the whole point of controlling the things that you can control including adjusting and reviewing thoughts and emotions is our responses to life situations. So yes. we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to the uh, mindful minute here shortly. So anyway, that's the quote of the week. We'll go with Bruce Lee. As you think, so shall you become. So think wisely, young think man wisely. and young woman. Um, all right. Super excited about this next piece. Uh, we have our three NFL players on our superheroes of the week. Super, so super. with that being said, let's get Evan, George, and Levine on. All right, here we go. Okay, that's our we trademark. We are recording. All right, go ahead, Em. All right, all right. Okay. Week three, 49ers versus Giants. We are honored this week to have two players in the tight end fraternity from the Giants joining us today. Evan Ingram and Levine Toilolo. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for being with us. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for having us. So glad to have you guys here. And, oh, yeah, George is here, too. So, right hey, George. Hey. Good to see you, oh, man. Hey there. How are we doing? <laughs> All right. Uh, quickly, just on, the, and probably most of everybody that's listening uh, knows our gentleman. But, anyway, Evan played college ball at Ole Miss, uh, drafted by the Giants with the 23rd pick in the first round of the 2017 NFL draft, listed around 6'3", 240. Is that still about right? Okay. So, yeah. uh, and also, I think college days you had yeah. All-American in there somewhere, too, right? I think you were named. Yeah, yeah, I got, I got one in there. I got yeah. one in there. <laughs> okay, well, congratulations on that. So, uh, so they've been at the Giants since he was drafted in 2017. Uh, Levine is also joining us, and I believe I have it correctly, uh, lovingly referred to as Tree. Uh, for his uh, <laughs> his uh, spatial yeah. his spatial distancing his nickname, from the ground. His nickname right here is Chief. We Chief? call him Chief. <laughs> oh, okay. I like it. That's great. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you. Glad I love you it. I'll answer, I'll answer to both. All right. Uh, Levine played college ball at Stanford, uh, one of the West Coast smart boys. Anyway, drafted by the Atlanta Falcons, fourth round of the 213 draft, uh, entering this is his eighth season. And uh, coincidentally, last season he was with the Niners, so he and George know each other. We're in the tight end room together there last season uh, sure. during their uh, Super Bowl run. Listed at 6'8", 260. Is that about right still? Are you leaner than that or bigger? Or what do you what do you got? Maybe uh, a little closer to 265, 270. Oh. Just kind of creep oh. Oh. Yeah, tight end thing going. All right. Well, that's good. They got a backup tackle if uh, somebody gets hurt then. You're good to go. All right. Yeah, I've been there. been there. All right. And then, uh, yeah, and joined the Giants uh, kind of during this offseason. So that's great. We're super glad to have you guys here. Thank you very, very much for taking time to be with us. And also married to the fabulous Stephanie. Uh, shout out, Steph. We love you very much. Um, and you, Levine. So, Levine, great to see you, Evan. Great to meet you. So excited. Um, okay, so we want to talk a little bit background. Um, how long have you guys known each other, and when did you first meet? So, however you want to go for this. Uh, I remember actually. I remember um, meeting George um, at the combine. Uh, we were uh, on the field, nervous as hell, uh, about to run our forties. And George was a little skinny back then. He was the little skinny kid, <laughs> um, skinny dude that was that ran really fast. Actually, he kind of kind of blew up a little bit at the combine. I remember and. Um, definitely got to chat up a little bit while we were really performing for our careers. Um, our careers are kind of taking off. So um, getting to know him during that time was cool. And obviously we've been keeping up with each other um, throughout the years. <clears throat> yeah, the, the combines, that's a high stress setting, isn't it? There's a lot going on there. I mean, everybody, because it feels like every single step you <laughs> take is like for your entire future. So yeah, a lot yeah, going that's on. That's crazy. There. Yeah. All right. And then um, Levine, you and George, and then, Obviously, with Evan, you got to know him in the Giants. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so me and George, I don't know if George remembers, but before the year before I got to uh, San Fran, I was in Detroit. And I remember after the game, well, before the game, my wife had texted me. She was like, yeah. I from, uh, <laughs> she was like, I've talked with his wife uh, on Instagram. So, like, you should go say hi to him after the game. So, later after the game, George. We, I like, saw George, each other. He, yeah, he was like. <laughs> 
hey, what's up, man? <laughs> he's like, my wife knows your wife from Instagram. And he's like, yeah, that's what I heard. And like, well, like sick, like, dude. Yeah, nice meeting you. Cool. Good, good game. And yeah, and then obviously last oh. year I got to be in the same room and uh, to enjoy all that has to offer with with that whole crew, George, Dwelly, and the uh, good old Ambo. Quite, quite the time. Ambo. <laughs> Selic time. Yeah. Ooh, baby. Yeah, Selic time. Endless stories. And then, uh, yeah, so I had a great year getting to know all these guys. And then, yeah, this year, just met Evan for first time. And, I mean, she got, got another group of great tight ends. I mean, I feel like everywhere you go is, is going to be the best uh, position room. So, you know, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to have been in some uh, – some great ones. Some good rooms with, yeah. Well, Levine, I was going to ask you about that. Just, I mean, and you maybe have already answered that. So just as tight end rooms go, and I know for people that haven't been in that situation, if you haven't sat in a room with a coach and had him grill you with tape and go through the X's and O's and all that, but yeah. as far as those tight ends, is there a different vibe between some of those rooms? Because you've been at a couple different places, and how does that yeah. really shake out for you? Yeah, I've been lucky. Um, a lot of the places I've been, have, all the coaches have, have been – pretty seasoned and, and great guys. Um, and, but like you said, it, it can be different. You know, I've had a one coach who it was his first year in, in the NFL. So you could definitely feel it. It was just a different vibe um, versus like you said, with in San Fran here in, in Detroit, we have a good one in uh, Freddie kitchens who was in Cleveland last year. And, and I mean, like you said, just the position group as a whole, I think player wise, um, I mean, a lot of the guys are, are pretty similar in, in terms of, uh, like, I, I think mindset, like tight end is, I feel like a position where you kind of do a little bit of everything. And uh, so I think a lot of guys, you know, regardless of what room I've been in, you know, all the guys take great pride in, in doing all that. Like, you know, whether it's receiving or, or getting getting dirty and getting in the blocking game. So. Like I said, I've been been pretty fortunate to to be around some some great ones. Yeah, yeah. Well, next to kind of QB, I mean, as far as knowing offensive schemes and everything that's going on, you got to be inside player, outside player, plus all the pass games. So there's mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of complexities. I think people kind of overlook with uh, being in that tight end position. So, all right, before we move on, Evan, you want to add anything about tight end rooms and that? So you've been at New York for your career. Uh, how's that been? Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been good. Um, definitely. Had some rough years um, since getting in the league, um, um, but really good coaches, um, really good rooms, um, good good guys like Levine coming in and um, putting in the work and uh, making going to work fun every day, um, no matter what the circumstances. So um, definitely uh, excited to be in the tight end room. The tight end is a really important position. Um, like, like Levine said, you got to really know everything. Um, and so it's important to kind of be on top of our stuff in that room because we're a big part of the game. Indeed. And both the teams, Giants and the Niners, really use their tight ends quite a bit. I mean, it's a little different on the league, but that's certainly something. So, well, let's jump into uh, just taking a look. So this last weekend we were talking before we got started. Um, I don't know if it's an all-time record, but somewhere between 7 and 11 ACLs, I think still being diagnosed, but at least 7, which uh, Adam Scheffler says was the most, you know, for years and years. So that's quite a deal. So Niners, we had Nicky Boza and uh, Solomon Thomas, both with ACL tears. Of course, we got – um, Jimmy's got the high ankle sprain. Uh, McCaffrey's is out, and then with the Giants, obviously you guys, Saquon uh, went down with another ACL. So, uh, just that's a lot of folks. And I don't know any conversations about. Uh, I know the Niner folks. There's a lot on social media about the turf being dangerous over there and all that kind of stuff. So I yeah. don't know. And then other people talking about we didn't have enough, you know, camp and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know anything going around. Thoughts on all of that, or is it just kind of bad circumstance? Uh, I think for me, yeah, hey, you have it. Go for it. No, no, you go ahead. You go ahead. No, you go. You go. You're the guest. <laughs> yeah, guest first. Guest first. You, yeah. yeah, I think it's just. I think it's. It's just 2020. It just continues to get worse and worse. Um, <laughs> I mean, it definitely. Um, yeah. I mean, football's football. You know, um, it's a it's a violent sport. Um, it's a un very unpredictable sport, um, and it's unfortunate to have. Um, all these injuries happen to such great talents. Um, the game loses when guys like that get hurt. So, um, 
and it's that it's just, it's a lot in the air. You know, the turf is new, and uh, we didn't have OTAs. Our bodies are kind of came in in shock and camp and stuff. So there's a lot that goes on. There's a lot that adds into it. Um, I think it's just kind of really unfortunate events happening and um, just some adversity. A lot of people and guys are just going to have to continue to fight through. All right. okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I 100% agree with everything you said. I mean, my biggest thing was, yeah, with the no OTAs, because that, that's 12 weeks where you're working out or, can like, competing. And in six of those weeks, you're competing, like running routes and stuff on fields. So your body kind of gets used to the hard cuts and stuff. Because no matter how amount of drill, how many drills you do in the off season, nothing replicates playing football. It just doesn't. So then you don't, and you don't. The camp's a little bit shorter, um, so like you try to get as many reps as you can, so you get conditioned. But then your body doesn't have that couple weeks to kind of recover to go before you go into the season. So it's just, I mean, and hey, like I said, it's 2020, and just it's been a terrible year. So. Just Dude. kind of uh, part of the vibe. Just got to kind of try to balance it out, I guess. Yeah. yeah. All right, Levine. Anything to add? Just thoughts on that, or you've been you've been around a bit. Uh, no, like you said, I think I think like I said, it's just football is such a, I mean, a violent violent game, but also just so many different factors. Um, you know, each play, you know, there's a risk of of you know that being your last play. You know, I think you hear it a lot. Like, you know, play each play like it's your last. And um, like you said, just, I mean, you have 11 guys on each side, a bunch of, like George said, competing against each other, whether it's, you know, you're reacting off of guys and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that's that's just part of the game of, you know, that uncertainty of, you know, what's going to happen. And um, like I said, I don't know too much as far as, you know, the turf compared to to how it's been in the past and stuff like that. But, I mean, I think, at the end of the day, there's, like I said, just so many moving parts that, um, you know, that's unfortunate and, um, you know, just that's that's the worst part about this game is, you know, the, the injuries and, and seeing guys go down. All right. Well, hopefully it uh, goes up from here. So we'll just have to stay tuned and kind of kind of see. Absolutely. Um, so question, do you prefer the fake crowd noises or do we think it's or do we prefer just the silence? Um, I was actually thinking about that earlier. I know we pumped noise our first game um, Monday night, and it was noticeable to where it was like kind of like weird. But then last game, I can't remember if Chicago even pumped noise or not. Levine, do you remember? Because I was trying to remember if they did or not. Because most of the time when you're out on the field and like, especially when the ball's in your hands and everything's flying around, you're between the whistle. Like, even when the crowd filled, I feel like that all blacks out, and I'm just in the zone so it's kind of it's <laughs> yeah. kind of weird it's kind of weird but um it's just it's a, a different vibe uh, it's kind of hard to explain because <laughs> this crowd is is a big factor like when they're in the seats and and you notice that like I said you notice it more on the sideline more than anything when the defense is making plays or you're off on the field you're all on the sideline during offensive play or whatever but um but with with empty stands it's kind of I think it's you're more locked in. I feel like I feel like I'm more kind of locked in and like more in the zone because it, it, it's kind of like another factor that's taken out um, of the game. But it's it's kind of fifty. I kind of like it. I kind of don't like it. But it's I'm kind of on the fence with it. Okay. Just you, to, did you guys yeah. practice with it at all? Like during camp? Um, we really? had some, we had some scrimmages or yeah. not scrimmages. They did. Um, we had some kind of had like a mock game, kind of get us ready for how it was going to be, um, and. They were kind of pumping a little bit, but it's like real low, like kind of like like real monotone crowd noise. It's not like they don't pump like cheers or anything. It's just like one tone. I, yeah, it's kind, of, it's kind of weird. That's what ours is like. But the first day that they did it, they put it like at the max level you could put it at, and you couldn't have a conversation with the person next to you. That's how loud it was. <laughs> and they did it for a whole. They did it for like three practices. It was awful. Oh. <laughs> And like at the game, I didn't even hear it at uh, when we played the Cardinals last week. I didn't even notice it. So it's weird. Yeah, I don't think, like you said, I think our home game, I think they did a little bit, but I feel like it was mostly like they'll play like a song here and there during the timeout. But I think like yeah. Evan said, as far as like noticing it when you're on the field, I don't think you, you really notice it. But I think it's it's more like when you're on the sideline, you just don't feel that energy. Like, you know, whether it's, you know, defense just made a play or offense made a play or, you know, third down, you know, where 
the crowd would kind of be, you know, going crazy and, and getting loud. Um, I think that's the biggest time when, when you just don't, don't notice that, that same energy from the environment. But when you're in the huddle and on the field, I think, like, like they said, like you're so locked in on, on what's going on that, that you don't really notice whether the, the noise is there or not, but more so on the sideline. One of the, say, like one of the, one of the biggest things I have noticed is like, it's, it's the first time I've really paid attention to the other sidelines energy. Like, mm-hmm. like late in the game, you could like the past couple of weeks, you can look over there and you can tell that when they're tired or when they're in the game, or when they're kind of just trying to sit down on the bench and, and when they're kind of worn mm-hmm. out, you can kind of get a better sense of the energy that they have um, um, going forward in the game. Cause I know on Sunday um, we were going fast. We had like three drives in a row where we drove the whole field and, uh, we were going fast tempo, and you can kind of just see their defense uh, when the offense is on the field just kind of hurting over there. And then they come on the field, and you kind of sense the little fake energy they were trying to get going. <laughs> so it's it's easy to kind of – kind of um, it's like little small things you kind of notice more on without the crowd, I, I would say. So it's a little easier to read what's going on with the other team without all that extra energy from the crowd. Oh, yeah. Especially like you being at the Bears, normally that would be all covered up or at least – kind of hidden a little bit more with their noise and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Well, from watching it on TV, it's really interesting that you can see, like I can hear Jimmy calling plays, you know, and I'm not going to yeah. pretend like I know what he's saying, but <laughs> I feel very engaged in the game right. or it's a lot easier for fans. Yeah. Yeah. Totally, so, um, okay. Well, this I think is a great lead in for one of our new segments on the show, uh, where we take a little peek into the fashion of football, <laughs> so last week we talked about George, George's whole Nike drip outfit and his uh, mm. dancing bears shoes, his whole style. We loved it. Crowd favorite. Uh, so Georgie, what do you, what do you bring in this week? Got anything to show us in that beautiful room? I'm going for some more dunks. Uh, I think these are the gardens. Um, very fun. I love them. Super comfy wearing them in the game. They're awesome. Big fan, you know, matches my floral wallpaper. If you guys couldn't tell. <laughs> I chose this. This is my room at the Greenbrier. It's beautiful. Um, but yeah, no, I don't wear a lot of dunks, but these and the Grateful Dead's I really like. And so uh had to snag these. I actually just came in last week, so I'm excited to wear these. Okay. Very right. excited. Got uh, dunks going Thank on you. with old George. Okay. So and I wear 13 if you ever want to send me shoes, dog. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ev, what do you got going? Any uh any fashion tips for the fans or where my, are you at? Yeah, my my fit this week is Come, this week coming up, it will be a secret. Um, it will be um, oh. revealed. It will be revealed when the, when the big game day comes. But okay, um, I was a I was an actual pioneer. I think I was I call myself a pioneer for my team um, this past week because there were a lot of guys that were scared to test the waters with their shoe game this week. Wait, um, so let's rewind really it. Tell us, uh, tell us the rule. What's the dress what's, code? What's of the, the rule? So we got. So our rule was that there was no sneakers allowed. No no extravagant crazy color sneakers just like dress shoes um clean shoes for your suit and you have to wear a tie though just suit shirt whatever um and for me i as soon as i heard suit i had the vision lined up i had my shoes lined up in my mind and i was like dang i really gonna be testing waters but you know i went for it um the low white ones um and i got a lot of i got a lot of heat for them (laughs) within my teammates the ones who were supposed to be supporting me Ah. Um, and why, why was they that? were they were, I was I was getting some heat for it, but they weren't really they should have really appreciated me because um, I didn't get in trouble. Um, I didn't get didn't get the fine notice. So um, I actually kind of <laughs> paved the way for um, the future road games when we travel um, for our guys to really kind of show a little bit more spark, a little bit more flashiness. So. Okay. Trailblazer. Yeah, that takes a lot yeah. of courage, man. And did you, was, love that a, that. was that a head coach thing or who'd you have to, who'd you clear that with? It was, it was a head coach. It was a head coach thing. And okay. um, what I did was I kind of like got in there and kind of put some feelers out with my position coach. Mm-hmm. Cause my position coach is kind of like the cool coach yeah. out of the bunch. So um, if kind of get him to back me, then, then I was kind of in the door. So, and I had a clean fit. So it wasn't like I was wearing tennis shoes with like looking braggy. Hey, I was, hey. Right. Uh, if you I was, could I send me a clean. photo, I'll, was, I'll flash it up for the fans. Okay. I'll make yeah, sure I was got clean. I was clean, um, head down. So I, 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 I call myself a pioneer for the for the All squad. Right. Well done. <laughs> we'll, way to take it on. So okay. Uh, and Levine, always swaggy. 
I feel like every time I picture you, it's in a suit. I remember one game you and Stephanie both wore suits. And I was shook. The after Whoa. game photos shook yeah. me. Our move. I'll flash that picture up too. Yeah. It's one of yeah, my favorites. It's probably on our Instagram somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so, this, like you said, I'm I'm pretty much either all or nothing. Either I'm going for comfort, or uh, like you said, I'll, or I'm gonna be in a suit. So this past week, see it. Yes. Uh, yeah, I went with the uh, oh blue, blue uh, pinstripes, uh, double breasted. You know, had a a little a little change up on there um you know i i had uh some classic dress shoes and you know not i didn't get the the you know the dunks memo like uh evan had going but uh i will say he he, he was pretty nervous in the locker room uh, before. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's just say when we was getting dressed he was he was going around like you said he was getting some feelers out there uh whether <laughs> whether he was gonna get in trouble or not and uh i'll say even even yesterday monday he came into the tight end room you know asking our tight end coach if if he got any feedback about his shoes so uh, you know he, he was looking looking <laughs> looking fly but uh i don't know if it was worth the stress that uh that i wow. saw my man going through uh on saturday <laughs> Uh, so are you going to be wearing uh, dunks or tennis shoes, Levine? Or are you going to stick to the dress shoes? Uh, I think I'm going to stick to the dress shoes. Uh, you know, if anything, I'll, I'll, I'll try to throw out some, maybe some, some clean white uh, shoes. I don't know if they'll be dunks. I'll, I'll see if, uh, like you said, I'll, I'll have to get some feelers, see, see if some guys get away with uh, other things in the near future before, uh, before I really pull the trigger on that. <laughs> I'll, I'll let Ev... Uh, keep trailblazing for us <laughs> all right well we'll uh, you keep in touch on that one and i'll make sure to post that up on our gram for everybody <laughs> okay all right anything else on fashion over there i mean i feel yeah. very informed very nice okay well <laughs> we'll continue to watch that was it awesome you know there's a i found a website i can't remember the name of it now but they actually they go through and they critique you know like three or four guys off of every single team and they do a video of it and they get oh, like wow. a, they rate you guys on like a you know five star scale and all that no stuff. pressure so, yeah so there's no added pressure yeah. so anyway uh, well let's uh let's chat just a little bit more football then so i'll just do a quick stat thing on kind of our last game so uh we got niners and giants coming up this next week niners come in one and one and giants at zero and two last game niners over the jets 31 13 and just quickly uh niner offense ended up with 359 yards 177 passing 182 on the ground with 29 rushes they did give up three sacks, though. So and that was a combo between Jimmy in the first half and then Nick Mullins, backup guy in the second. Did a good job. BDN. Yep. Uh, defense. Uh, Jets ended up with a total of 277 yards, 173 passing, and uh, 104 on the ground with 29 rushes and uh, got one sack. So Giants, they traveled to Chicago, played the Bears, ended up on the short end 13-17. to 17. Just second. Okay, I'm getting tapped because I'm not talking into my microphone enough. So it makes I guess, a difference. Okay, as I'm an editor, be, she's as the, the editor, auditor. Yeah, as she's editor. Producer, as all the things. Uh, she just cranked makes a my, difference. Wow. Okay, makes a difference. <laughs> Sorry, fellas. George, don't get me started on your video quality right now. Yeah, she's she's just going <laughs> over the top right now. Anyway, okay. Greenbrier um, Wi Fi. Giants. <laughs> so I was digging through, and all of this was from the Giants uh, website. But anyway, there were two streaks that ended in that game, which you might not be aware of. Uh, Dan Jones, uh, once he started, he had a 13-game streak of throwing at least one TD pass. The New York Giants record was by Y.A. Tittle back in the day with 15 straight games, but that ended. He did not throw a touchdown pass, so his streak ended at 13. The other streak that ended was Saquon. He had 30 games in a row where he had at least one reception, and uh, I think the NFL record was at 34. So he was off of that but did not get that in. He ended up with 24 yards. Wow. So, uh, total 295 yards for the Giants. He had a great, it was pumped up, 95-yard drive in the second half between the third and fourth quarter, apparently. That was really good. Had 75 yards rushing on 18 attempts, and Jones was 25 of 40 for 220 yards. So, and Evan pulled down six receptions for 64 yards, leading receiver in the effort. So, we had that going on. So, anyway, Giants defense shut out the Bears in the second half, so played pretty solid on that point. They had four sacks. And uh, I believe uh, at least one, I, 
my notes here aren't clear, one or two interceptions, so they came down with that pretty good. Bears ended up having uh, 30, 304 yards, 169 passing, 134 in the rush. So anyway, just kind of toss it open. Any uh, from our – so Levine and Evan, anything on the Bears game, kind of reflections or thoughts, where that was at, and would we learn or any of that stuff? Yeah, um, definitely definitely came out on the wrong end. Um, uh, had a really good second half, um, started kind of get going and um, getting points on the board, P- putting long drives together, um, had a chance at the end um, to win it, um, but came down to the last play, um, didn't get it. Um, but I think it showed our, our team's fight. Um, we were down 17-3 to at half and – yeah, 17-3 at half, and um, defense came out and, and shut them down. And we had, a, like I said, we had the opportunity to end the game. So um, I think we're in a good spot. Uh, our spirits are good. Our energy is good. I came in and got work yesterday and knocked out the film and some more work today on our off day. So it's um, got to just kind of keep rolling with the momentum. Got a tough challenge going in this week um, against the 49ers. Um, and Mr. Kittle, so um, it's going to be a good one. I mean, Levine's going to be leading the, the week in practice, so we'll be so we'll be ready. All right, and then just for you guys, just because uh, I've chatted with George about this, do you guys is your process sometime, say Monday or somewhere in there? I mean, does the head coach sit down with you guys as a team and go through film or have a discussion? Kind of that part of it oh, yeah. is there kind of that's that's kind of standard, isn't it? Yeah, um, there were some there were some weird rules uh, yesterday. Um, with the COVID stuff to where we couldn't um, meet as a full team or something. Um, we had to work out in different groups. So it was, was kind of weird yesterday, but um, tomorrow we'll um, definitely um, break down the film as a team, hit, put together little little clips of examples here and there, and, right. and then dive right into the next opponent. So Okay. Review and a little accountability in front of the whole crew. That kind of keeps everybody honest. Okay. Yeah. Levine, any thoughts about kind of bears and that stuff you want to – Add on? Uh, no, I think Evan Evan did a good job. Like you said, uh, you know, I think always looking back, obviously there's there's things that you know watching the film that that you want to improve. And um, but I think, like you said, our I think our team has the right mindset as far as um, you know attacking the challenges that that we have. And um, I'd say for us, especially at you know us as tight end group. Um, we always like to to start with ourselves, which, you know, I feel like it was similar in, in San Fran. Um, just obviously looking at, at what you can do better um, individually and then as a group, as a tight end group. And, uh, you know, like I said, we're excited for the challenge that we have with, with George and, and them coming in. And um, just we know it's going to be a, a tough challenge. And, um, you know, we're just ready to get back to work. All right. Uh, George, you didn't play last week though. So, but uh, did not. How's the mood there at the old Niner Land at the Greenbrier? And uh, any comments or thoughts on the Jets game? Uh, I mean, everyone just said that in the locker room it was tough, just because you know we had two huge injuries to guys, um, which is brutal. So they said it really didn't feel like a win. It was just kind of a sor- somber, somber uh, mood. But uh, you know, obviously, guys are excited and uh, you know get the first one under, the, uh, under our belt. And um, we had young guys come in and make some plays because, you know, uh, our rookie wide receiver, Brandon, missed most of training camp in the first game. And he came back and made some plays. Um, and, you know, Nick got to get in, make some uh, – he got to throw the ball around. So, <clears throat> I think we're in, we have a good feeling moving forward. Um, definitely going to miss the guys we lost. But uh, the good thing about our team, we have, we have a lot of – our positions are deep. You know, we got a lot of guys in a lot of places that can make plays. And, um, I'm looking forward to new guys making opportunities for themselves. You know, we just moved up our practice squad running back, Hasty, who had an incredible camp, and I'm excited to see what he can do out there. Um, and then, like I said, Brandon's back. So I think it's it's going to be fun moving forward. And we just signed a new DN, too, uh, who our D-line coach absolutely loves. So it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to playing these guys because I need both their jerseys. So it did. <laughs> now, I was really going to ask, like, this is going to be really difficult. I don't know how we can get both of them, but um... – No, yeah. both. All right, yeah, all Levine right. Dwelly's going to fight me for years, but I told him to <laughs> kick rocks. Um, and know, just like, special message to uh, Nick and the Bosa family and then Solomon and the Thomas family. We are so sorry, and we love you guys, and just hurting, but also send you guys love, and we're going to miss you. So um, 
Yeah. Yeah, and really, not too, be the same. all the players, I mean, yeah, everybody. And Saquon and just the whole, a lot of folks went down and just, uh, you know, we've all kind of been through that in different stages. So it's a painful thing. You work so hard, especially so early in the season, and you're all excited and getting there. And so both for the team dynamic as well as the individual, it's really difficult. So uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Well, I think you guys have kind of touched on that, unless you guys had something else. I know the Niners are going to come back. It looks mm-hmm. like Nick Mullins will be the starter. I don't know if George is going to say anything about that, mm-hmm. but we so that'll be new for us. Yeah, no maybe, clue. Maybe Luke. Yeah. I just work here. Yep, gotcha. <laughs> uh, so, but uh, he's proven. And so, now he's, was he a Mississippi State guy? You were, because Evan, you're Ole Miss. Where'd, where'd Brett Favre Ole Miss. Is Southern Brett, Miss. Miss. Southern Miss. Okay, so he's a Southern yeah. Miss because he broke all of Brett Favre's records. So he's like, and he did, yeah. So he, I mean, he can wing it. So we'll uh, we'll see. We've got a lot of confidence in old Nick. So, all right. Well, good enough on that, gentlemen. Well, let's talk. So, uh, as you guys know, we do a charity focus each week, and uh, before we, uh, so this week we're doing, and when we're playing on the road, we work with the team, and so we contacted the Giants, and um, you guys were great. Ethan Medley from your group. I don't know if you guys know him or not, but he works with uh, kind of community impact stuff. So uh, he helped us and sent us some places. And then Evan on purpose, just because we were trying to stay with the tight end theme, uh, you were designated as the team captain over at Eva's. And so we went with the Eva's and so we're set up to, we should have some great interviews with those guys coming up. So I guess before we get into looking at that and what you guys are doing there, just kind of, if you guys could talk a little bit, and George has done this, but just thinking about, you know, service, giving back, volunteering, that kind of stuff, just your experiences either growing up or college or the NFL and kind of, why that stuff's important to you guys. Cause I, I know Evan and, and Levine, I'm not sure where you're plugged in. I'm sure you're plugged in somewhere here with the giants organization doing stuff. So if you guys just talk a little bit of the, why it's important and what that means to you guys. Either one can start. You guys got it. <laughs> Good job. I'll, uh, I'll kick it off. Um, I, I know growing for me growing up, um, just being a fan of the game, um, I love watching football. I love watching NFL on Sundays. I love watching college ball. I mean, I idolized um, these football players um, growing up. Uh, I remember my mom took me to an Ohio State game, um, I think middle school. Um, and my mom went to Ohio State, so I was brainwashed from birth to be a Buckeye fan. So, right. um, And uh, I remember just being there at the game and, and seeing the – seeing all the players and, um, and watching them come out of the locker room and on the field. And I was just in awe. So I, I know the impact, um, that, uh, that we have as, as football players. So, um, just being able to, to, to be intentional in our communities and, um, to build relationships with people that idolize us for what we do on the football field to help their lives in a better way, um, and, and impact somebody for the greater good. Um, it's important. So, um, especially all the things that we're doing with the Giants and with all the crazy things and unfortunate things going on in our world and society today to kind of use our stage and our platform um, to, to be on the better side um, of change um, is, is very um, important to me and um, us athletes. All right. Appreciate that very much. Thanks. Levine, just you want a little bit about your kind of experiences with it. You've been in the league now for eight years and I'm sure at Stanford you did some stuff. So just, kind of uh, what's your journey been with all that? Yeah. um, Like you said, I think the biggest thing for me growing up, I was lucky enough to, uh, my dad is a pastor. And so one of the things he kind of started, like Evan said, just utilizing the impact of sports. uh, It's called Gridiron Ministries, which, you know, uses, it started with football, but now they've kind of branched out just with uh, just more sports, you know, boys and girls. But using, you know, just simply allowing kids to come and, and work out and train. And then also, but using that to mentor them and, and kind of check on them with school work and just kind of how they're doing, um, you know, off the field, in the classroom, um, just at home, stuff like that. So, like I said, I was lucky to, to kind of grow up in, in, in that, obviously with my dad leading that, but then, you know, as I, grew up and got a little bit older going into high school, college, and, and now in the league, uh, I'm able to kind of go back and, and still talk to, you know, kids and run camps and stuff like that. And just, um, like I said, just use sports as, as the great platform that it is to, to kind of be that connecting force, but then, you know, letting that branch out into other parts of, 
uh, of their lives and, and just really focus on helping, whether it's, you know, inner city youth and, and things like that, uh, to just really emphasize, you know, everything else, character, you know, and things off the field. Um, and so, like I said, with, with my dad being the head of Great Iron Ministries, I've been, been able to go go back home and, and do a few camps and stuff like that. And then, um, you know, I've been lucky to, you know, be at, at different organizations where, you know, the community relations team has, has been really great in connecting you with the community. And uh, especially last year in San Fran with uh, Saya, who, you know, my, my wife was able to get in touch with her and, and uh, you know, one of the things we did was take some of the inner city youth to to go see uh, the movie Just Mercy and then also be able to gift them with, um, you know, like tablets and stuff like that to help them in school um, with their academic stuff. And, you know, I'm looking forward to to getting out here in the community in New York. And and like Evan said, just continue to use that platform to to just help in any way we can. Well, that's great. So I appreciate you sharing those pieces and we kind of heard from George on those. So we'll let him kind of pump in there unless George, you got something burning. You want to chip in on? We no. Kind of chat with no, him. They both guess. covered. No, they cover all the topics. So yeah. Yep. They crushed it. So, so, so um, so the charity focus this week is Eva's Village, which is uh, one of the sponsored charities uh, as part of the New York Giants. So I think Emma's got the mission here, so we'll do that and then kind of let Evan just talk a little bit about what they're about and what you guys are doing. All right. Eva's Village is a nonprofit, comprehensive behavioral health and social service organization with a mission to provide care and support for people struggling with poverty, hunger, homelessness, and addiction. Core programs include treatment, recovery, food and housing, education and job training. So Evan, as the team captain, we saw your tweet with the uh, uh, organization on the back of your helmet. That was super cool. Um, what is a team captain for Eva's Village? Yeah, so um, what we did as um, a team um, is we split up our team uh, to really nine groups. Um, there's uh, nine groups to really um, attack all areas around um, New Jersey and New York. Um, there's a team for the Bronx. There's a team for Manhattan. There's a team for um, there's a team for New Jersey. Um, and I'm in actually my my team is in Paris, New Jersey, um, Newark. I mean, our our team is spread around the whole entire um, community um, that supports us and watches us. So, um, and my team is called actually called the Harlem Globe Charters. Uh, right. We're the Globe Charters. So. Um, it's about seven players um, and two coaches, um, and we got teamed up through um, with Eva's Village um, through the Giants. Um, and uh, what we what we started to really do um, is just build a relationship with the people in charge there, um, people that are helping the clients and um, offering these services um, to to help these people in need. And um, what we what we really started doing as a team is we we started fundraising um they started off actually as a soup kitchen um to feed um patterson um feed the homeless and and the hungry but it's growing into um the the force that it is supporting mental illness and addiction and homelessness and i'm um, really all areas um that that hurt um that city so um we as a team we raised almost we're coming up on a thousand dollars right now i know we as a as a group is have um, donated five thousand, and um, the league is going to match that. And um, and then we have another goal of another ten thousand through our fans and community. So, um, and uh, we're also starting next Tuesday um, mentor groups. Um, there's about um, ten to maybe I think fifteen clients um, that we're going all going to split up and um, get get paired up with and kind of mentor them. Um, kind of put a put a, um, a person they look up to and they watch on Sundays and they idolize in their corner. Um, and be, be there for them, um, get to know them, um, and get to um, fellowship with them and, and, and connect with them on a level that can give them support, um, put somebody in their corner, um, and help them get through some of the things that they're struggling with. So um, our team is great, doing a lot of good work, and I'm um, excited to get going. You guys got the vest on. I don't even have a vest yet. So, yeah, there we go. So um, check us out. They're very warm. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Uh, over I, I, at, think, uh, I think mine's Angela's? in the mail. I don't know. Some got lost. <laughs> I'll, I'll connect um, my people with your people. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll take make care sure of you get taken care of. Yeah, Please. So. <laughs> um, well, something that we talked about last week was, so since uh, the 49ers were also in New York, uh, was, so we're from Iowa, and just – the vastness of New York City, I I honestly can't really wrap my head around it. I went twice in college, but with a volleyball team. And so it was 
uh, just a very different experience. And so being able to partner and talk to organizations like this has been really eye opening and a uh, privilege for all of us. But I have to say, um, the entire Eva's organization had nothing but incredible things to say about the giants and the work that you're doing. Yeah. And they were so, I mean, they kind of just knew that you were going to say yes when we asked that we were going to do this. And so, um, <coughs> it's really cool to have an NFL team care so much. Well, and be doing so a lot committed. of stuff in the organizational structure with nine teams, you know, doing that and somebody appointed to uh, the team captain notion, all that. So kudos to the giants and really trying to make an impact in the community. So Levine, are you on a team? I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but I mean, are you, uh, yeah. where, where, where are you at and who, where are you working? Yeah. So our team, uh, we were working with the rise organization um, and their, their focus is on voting. So they're, we kind of kicked off a whole campaign. Obviously the NFL has been doing a big thing too, but just really starting, you know, within our team and just kind of emphasizing the the importance to vote. We kind of did a little presentation for our team here, which I mean, it's been awesome that coach judge has, he's really allotted um, good, some good amounts of time to, to really focus on, on these different issues. So yeah, like, uh, like I said, our team was focusing on voting and, and just really trying to get the word out, especially now during uh, COVID, um, the organization told us that, you know, the, the registration has been down literally by millions um, just because DMVs are closed and stuff like that. So really just trying to get information out to, you know, fans and just, just the public about how they can, you know, register online and, and just kind of the different deadlines that, that are out there for all the different states and stuff like that. So that's, that's been the main focus for, for our team. That's great. Yeah. No, we had get out the vote shirts on last week for last week's mm-hmm. podcast. So yeah, no, we're certainly supporting that. So if you're listening, go register, get a friend registered and, and make sure you vote because each vote counts, each voter counts. So, yes. um, all right. Well then let me just, uh, you know, so one of the things that we've in talking, so at least the first two weeks and just, you know, my background is criminal defense lawyer. I spent a lot of time in jails and prisons and such. So um, in your work, and maybe even just because you've been in New York a little bit longer and that kind of stuff, but just are there some systemic things that you're seeing that cause people problems kind of out there and or like what kind of, you know, impact on families and or individuals are you seeing by some of the things that are going on? Um, Yeah, I mean, there's I mean, I can go uh, list on and on about um, some of the things in this country and in this world that people are dealing with and um, it's a lot of unfortunate things, um, but just uh, just really getting to know Eva's Village um, and, and learning about um, the people that they help and the people that they deal with. Um, mental illness um, and addiction, uh, people um, who have have suffered traumas growing up um, and maybe fully not recovered from um, when they get into society or when they get on their own, um, they struggle um, and they make they make decisions and they make. Um, moves that um, that cripple them and put them in bad situations and then it kind of just um, all tumbles from there um, so um, just hearing the stories and, and, and seeing um, the things through Eva Village and, and what they're attacking and what they're trying to help and what we're kind of getting involved with um, and a lot of, like there has been a lot of conversation about mental illness and sports and, and, and mental um, strength and things like that. So um, it's definitely an area that I never really um, paid a lot of attention to. I kind of, I'm kind of just a person that just kind of gets up and goes and, and whatever's in my way, I kind of just attack it and, and move on from it. But there's a lot of people that struggle mentally and um, and make a lot of decisions and, and a lot of things happen to them um, because of it. Um, so um, I think um, just mental illness and, and, and struggling with addiction and things like that um, kind of seeing that through Eva's Village has really given me an, an open perspective on some of the things that we can do to help. Okay. And it sounds like one of those things is trying to mentor, build relationship with people, kind of normalize their experience and oh. maybe model some good decision making and the such and keep them involved in treatment and or whatever else is going on with them. So have, are there other things that either Eva's Village is doing or that you've seen that have been helpful with folks either in those situations or others? Um, you know, I, I, like you said, um, they're, that's what they've been doing. They've been mentoring these people. Um, and I think the, the, the biggest thing that I'm really excited about um, is um, and what they've been doing is um, that we all have struggles. Um, like I said, they people idolize us as athletes and think we have it all figured out. Um, and think that we have no struggles and, um, and, and we don't deal with any 
a pain or heartache. Um, but we're going to have opportunity to really open up and, and get to know um, these clients. And um, I've been through things. I've been through struggles. I, I still struggle. Um, and we all do. Um, and so giving them that, 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 that person that they look up to and think is perfect and being able to relate to them on their level um, and, and maybe not fully their level, um, but to be able just to sit down and listen and, and understand them and, and, and be cordial and, and, and be relatable to them um, is, is, it's going to be priceless. Yeah. Um, so just opening up maybe your own vulnerability makes it, you know, kind of okay for them to address their issues if you're working on theirs too. So Levine, I don't want to leave you out. Anything else you want to kind of add on that? And maybe all of you guys. Um, so if people want to get involved, uh, we're, we will have Eva's village kind of links and we'll probably post the nine different charities that folks are working with through the giants. That'll all be available on the, our uh, webpage at Thunderbird performance. So, but, uh, if you, if folks are asking, you know, how could, what would you encourage people to do either on an individual basis or kind of systemic look, if you have ideas? I think the biggest thing right now um, is donate. Um, COVID is um, really giving Eva's Village a really hard time because they're such a um, a, a personal um, organization. Um, they they all their work, a lot of their work is done in person and hands on, and and COVID has has put a lot of restrictions on that. Um, so um, there's a GoFundMe link um, on my Twitter page, and um, I obviously definitely will share with you guys. Um, uh, I think don't, donating right now is the biggest way to help because it's it's going to help them feed the hungry. It's going to help um, them keep things in operation. Um, and um, right now, everything's kind of remote through Zoom. Um, and that's kind of how our mentorship is going to be done. But um, donating right now is the biggest help because it's going to help help Eva's Village um, keep it going um, and keep their efforts up. Well, and speaking of that, so... Uh, George, on behalf of the family there, we will, we're going to be part of the, your player match there at Eva's. So our donation will go there to try to help boost that piece up to pull more money out of the NFL. So we'll be uh, adding our contribution to that as well. So, uh, Levine, any thoughts on just encouragement to folks, ideas on what they might be able to do to step up and or help? Um, not like you, I think, like Evan said, just, I mean, donating, whether it's your time, resources, um, whatever it is. Um, I think for me, just focusing on, on the youth has, has been something that, that I've learned a little bit with, like I said, working with rise and just, um, trying to help, you know, the, the younger generation understand just the, the power they have, like you said, as far as attacking systemic issues that the power that they can have within, you know, something as simple as voting and just, um, trying to understand, understand, you know, that power, um, you know, I, I was lucky to, to go to some good schools and stuff like that. And, and even still, you know, I didn't really quite understand, um, you know, like I said, just that power and just the resources on, on how to really utilize that. And, um, so like, like I said, just, just pouring back into the youth, whether it's, um, you know, knowledge that you have, or just your time, like, like Evan has said, you know, just relating to people, um, or even, you know, if you're fortunate to, to pour back into, you know, resources and, and give back that way, um, I think any, any little bit, um, you know, helps. That's great. So, George, uh, some final words on that. Any thoughts? I know they've covered a lot of ground there. Just want to give you a little platform there if you're encouraging folks. And I know you're out in the Bay Area, so, but. Yeah, I mean, um, like with what Levine said, I mean, donating, whether it's your resources, your time, or just your effort in general uh, to youth. That's one thing I've always loved. Like one of my favorite foundations or um, things is the Iowa Children's Hospital, which is overlooks uh, Kinnick Stadium. You know, they Get do away. the wave in the first quarter and all that. Mm -hmm. Hi guys. But they, um, that's just like one thing that's always connected for me. It's because, I mean, I live a fantastic life. Like I haven't had terrible struggles my entire life and I've been able to play football my entire life. I haven't gotten unlucky. And then there's kids that are dealing with things that they had no choice, you know, and they're just dealing with those things. And so if I can take an hour out of my day once a week to just talk to them and make them laugh, um, they get to hang out with a football player. Cause I know like Evan said, like people idolize football players cause it's really cool what we do. Um, and as a kid, like, you know, football was my favorite thing ever. And um, so if I can make one kid laugh, then I know that I might've helped them for that day or that week or an autograph here or there helps kids. And so, I always just try to, if it's, you know, the youth, I always try to do everything I can just to put a smile on someone's face because you don't know what they're going through. So, 
Well, I guess I just want to affirm to the, just you guys appreciate the platform that you do have and the honor and the character that you guys are bringing to that. So kudos to you guys really appreciate that. And I, I know that's to me, the more I've gotten to know NFL players through my you know relationship with George and other guys, um, it's really more the norm than it's not, you know, there's some unbelievable guys and people within the NFL doing some great things and um, your commitment to giving back and helping others. So um, great example for everybody. And so again, all the uh, links for the giants, if you're out on the East coast and want to do something, that'd be great. The donation link for the players matches there. So if you guys, anybody wants to contribute to that, that'll also be available. And uh, we just, uh, we wish you guys first, thank you very much for taking time to be with us. And so uh, we're Really appreciate that. I know you guys are super busy and all that. And so we'll uh, wish you guys just mostly stay healthy and take care of yourself. And then, uh, Emma, did you have anything to close with? Because I'm just rambling. I do rambling. have a couple I things to close with. Was, I was like, was, come on. She's bumping my hip no. here. So sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, something that our family always talks about is uh, we are very attached to superheroes. Um, if you can see, well, you guys can't see, but on our podcast table, we have a lot of different superhero things. And Something that we've been talking a lot about is, and we think a lot about, is when you have a power, right? And so it might not always be laser beams or flying or whatever, but it's connection and it's your reach and it's your voice. And when you have the superpower, the absolute superpower of being an NFL athlete, um, using that power to give back and to touch someone else's life is so important. And when we were talking to the Eva's Village people, they said the number one thing that COVID disrupted with them was their connections. And that was the biggest thing that had set their clients back. And so that Zoom was like starting to help and everything. But I guess I want to bring this up because um, COVID obviously has really disconnected our world and presented a situation of very hurt and sad and lonely people now. And so reaching out to people and connecting with people is insanely important. And whether it's a friend or a family member or somebody don't take those moments for granted because uh, obviously we don't know how many more of them we're going to have. Um, and then as a woman, um, special heart moment for Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, what a loss to our community, to yeah. our world. And so voting is a privilege. Now it is a right, thank goodness. Um, but for a woman, make sure that you get out, make sure that you vote. And as you superhero men, um, encouraging young women and young people especially young women but to get out and vote and to use your voice is incredible and thank you for using your platform because I see obviously I see George every day and he's such a superhero but then looking to you guys and having these conversations it's it's inspiring it's and inspiring. It, it's amazing and we so appreciate you being on this podcast and sharing your voice and sharing your mission and sharing your resources so, so thank you. You are all superheroes to us. So With great power you. comes great responsibility. And we hope to have both of your jerseys on our wall. Yeah, get after that, George. So. <laughs> yeah. All right. yeah. You guys take care. Good luck the rest of the season. Just be safe, and uh, we'll sure be watching on Sunday. Thank you so much for joining us. All right? Thank, thank you all for having me. Yes. Right. Thank you, guys. All right. See you, guys. Seeing you guys. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Tree, see you, dog. See you, Evan. Thanks yeah. for coming on. Bye, George. All right. Thanks, guys. See you, fellas. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Guys, I've got uh, Angela on and Chip with uh, Eva's Village. And so uh, Bruce Kittle and Emma here, and she'll do a formal intro. I'm just doing the law stuff because I'm the lawyer. But anyway, so i just given you guys notice, and you guys know we're doing a Zoom call. It is being recorded with the anticipation that it'll be part of our podcast, both an audio release on a couple formats, platforms, and then it'll also be in video uh, released on our YouTube channel. So you guys know that, and you're okay with that? Is that all right? Yes. Very good. Okay. So I'll hand it over to Emma again. I'll just say thank you so much for being with us. Super appreciate your time and all you guys do. So, all right. All right. Here we go. Okay. Okay. So coming off of our fabulous interview with our NFL superstars, uh, we are now blessed with uh, two people who are a part of Eva's Village. So we have Chip and Angela. So, um, Eva's Village was founded as a soup kitchen in 1982 and began serving 30 meals a day to feed the hungry in Patterson. In response to the related issues of poverty, addiction, mental illness, and homelessness programs and services grew out of the original soup kitchen to address these new needs. Today, Eva's Village is a nonprofit, comprehensive behavioral health and social service organization with a mission to provide care and support for people struggling to overcome obstacles to recovery, independence, 
and stability. So, uh, Angela, we'll start with you. Angela Bronxton Terry is the Director of Substance Abuse Counseling and Criminal Justice Service Coordinator. She began with Eva's Village in August of 2008, and she has a master's in social work from Rutgers and is licensed is a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor. So, Angela, thank you. Welcome. And then also want to introduce uh, Chip, so Howard Chip Yerger, um, currently employed at at local 79 laborers union in new york newly married a a hey. melissa yeah and baby congratulations go baby congratulations. Yeah. nice Yay. nice and then a uh, former client of eva's village so uh angela and chip have worked together so we're very excited to hear y'all's story and have you on the podcast so thank you so much for being here um hidden pearls is all about the people and organizations like eva's who have dedicated their life to helping others and building community so we feel very excited to have both of y'all on the call today today. Um, so Angela, let's kick it off. Uh, what drew you to public service like this and how did you get started in the work that you are doing now? Okay. First and foremost, I want to say thank you for having us, Bruce and Emma. Um, what started me in this field was something that happened to me that was more on a personal level. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease and I uh, was sent for pain management and I struggled with the pain management. Um, and as a result, um, I know the struggles that people have when it's so fast to become addicted to something that's prescribed. And um, once I started um, my education, continue my education uh, over at Passaic County Community College, I just kept going because I wanted to help people. I know a lot of people that struggle with addiction, criminality. I have friends, close friends that continue to struggle, family members that struggle and everything. So. It was dear to my heart to get into this because so often um, it's hidden. People turn a blind eye and also it's ostracized. People really don't want to be affiliated or talk to or communicate with people who struggle with addiction and the realms of addiction, not knowing that active addiction is really a symptom of what actually is going on with the individual. Right. You know, that's their way of escaping and numbing. Yep. So, so, and you know, and I really appreciate just, I mean, the number of folks that struggle with this issue is so much larger than I think most people would imagine. And then when you couple that with the kind of ostracization, like you said, you know, like people don't want to deal with it <clears throat> in part, I think, because sometimes if I get too close to it, I'm going to acknowledge some of my own issues. So there's a lot of kind of hiding in this whole field. So anyway, so thank you very much for that. Um, well then, so which in honestly, I've, I've known a lot of drug alcohol counselors and their big hearts, a lot of passion. They really care deeply, but like your story, usually there's some kind of personal link that kind of kicks them in either a family member or a friend or personal. So anyway, we thank you for what you do. So your jobs, you have two of them. I've got you down as director of substance abuse counseling and also the criminal justice coordinator. So um, let's do the criminal justice coordinator first, because I didn't find a lot of that on the website. I was kind of looking. So tell us a little bit about what that looks like and what, what you do with that and what Eva's does. Actually, I, I um, communicate, facilitate, uh, direct um, systems connections with people who have criminal um, legalities in their life, like if they're involved in, in legality. So I basically, I'll go over to places, courtrooms and things like that, and I'll advocate for them. I also assist them with getting readjusted to the community if um, after they have gone to prison or to the county jails, and I advocate and I help them and um, guide them through the, the, uh, the program and the things that we have to offer here. But many, many times I advocate so much for them. But I also um, help um, control a lot of the the, um, the legal. How, how can I put it? I don't want to say names. I, I okay. <laughs> Promote coordination is what I do with the legal systems. Understood. With the legal systems, because yeah. I don't want to point one out over the other. But sometimes it doesn't tell drug court. It doesn't tell MAP. It doesn't tell probation. Yep. It doesn't tell a lot of times the uh, municipal courts. So basically, it's it's coordinated services and communicating and, cor and showing up in court and doing things like that. Yeah. But letting the clients know also that um, I'm there for them as an advocate. 
Right. No, and just in my own experience as a criminal defense lawyer, that's, you know, having substance abuse, either an agency or counselors and or, because it was always part of the package for so many of our clients. And then because that's just kind of, like you said, a symptom and there's other things going on, but they do get tangled up in the criminal justice system. It's really complicated, needs some advocacy. And so you guys help on the front end when they might be looking at going in and or placed on probation. And then also do if they have a jail term or coming out of prison with a halfway house placement on parole. So you guys help kind of on both ends. Okay. And I actually admire what, what you um, told me that you was working with the reentry program. Yeah, I did a lot. Of and I actually work. have done quite a bit, a lot, uh, um, quite a lot of that too, through Evas at one point. Yeah. Where we were over in jail and we were helping them get connected to services and become better people. Yeah. So I worked on a mentoring program for guys coming out of prison, so hooked them up with volunteers and we did kind of a monthly, two, twice a month kind of meeting and then helped them with jobs and all that. So, so all of that matters. So, okay. So that's kind of the criminal justice coordinator piece. And then how many beds do you have allocated for kind of reentry halfway house stuff? Well, um, I'm not too sure of the beds that we have. I know we have 120 beds altogether. I know we have 36 women beds. Okay. But I can tell you by percentage, uh, 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 a large percentage, maybe 80% are criminal justice. Have some. Are, um, criminal, yeah, have criminal involvement. Either yeah, probation and or parole coming back. Probation, parole, gotcha. yeah, drug court, mm-hmm, okay. as um, ISP. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that's a whole bunch of stuff and a job in and of itself. And then, uh, so the other piece is the director of substance abuse counseling. So tell us a little bit about what that looks like for you and what you guys at EVAs do for that. Well, actually I'm the director over the outpatient um, program located at 20 Jackson street It's one of the outpatient programs at EVAs village and the population that I serve are individuals who have criminal um, involvement. We do have a criminal justice track in that program. Okay. Um, my duties consist of um, ensuring that the program adhere to state and um, county, whatever um, regulations and guidelines. I, I make ensure that it's running correctly. I um, clinically supervise staff. I do also facilitate groups and didactic classes. I have individual counseling sessions. I do have a whole uh, entire caseload. I love the groundwork. Um, Even though my position consists of a lot of administrative duties, I love being hands-on and interacting with the clients because that's what made my day. Right. So it's, 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 it, uh, this program started maybe two years ago, three years ago, because we had the uh, main, outpatient program, but the outpatient Jackson Street is the one that has the criminal justice track. Gotcha. And we do have criminal lifestyle groups and things like that there. Okay. So, and just, I'm making, cause I think there's a, I don't know, there's a, a reality within that context that you just mentioned though, that I think a lot of people don't appreciate. And not that the substance abuse and addiction issues are so different, but when you commingle it with criminal justice issues, whether you're on probation or parole, and you have to deal with that whole thing. So you guys separate out folks within the criminal justice system that are going through some kind of recovery program that's separate from folks who might not be tangled up with the criminal justice system on their own recovery program. So are those there are two separate programs like that? Well, they're not really too separate because sometimes we have overspill. The, um, okay. the, the larger program consists of all. But however, it's with my main focus, what I want to do okay. is create this track. Gotcha. Because we, we also, you know, we look at um, opioid addiction and everything that's going on with the opioid crisis and everything. But a lot of times we dismiss the drug dealers. And that's an addiction in itself as well. Yeah. So I would like, you know, my program is focused on that because we can fix people who use the drugs. But what about the people who sell the drugs, sell the drugs? So even if we fix the people who use the drugs, it's still temptation if we don't assist the others that sell the drugs. So my program is for everyone who's involved. Everyone's in the same group. Same consequences. No one's any different than the other. And we just sit down and we get naked and we talk about addiction and the ramifications that come along with that and the impact that it has on families Okay. and everybody, environment and everything. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's it's deep stuff. So yeah, no, I've been in a few of them myself. So okay, all good. Well, um, maybe just uh, this is a great time to kind of sh- just jump over to Chip, if that's okay, Angel. Do you mind if we absolutely? Okay, yes. just because he's been so intrigued, he keeps nodding his head about everything you said. So <laughs> Chip, yeah, that's Angela. Man. I know, I know, man. She's in there. So and I just want to say this too, because like like uh, my entire career, I've always been more kind of guy in the trenches and you know the street level stuff. Because the other never. But it's not real often that you find people who ascend to administrative duties that keep their hands kind of, you know, in the programming. So I just want to give you a shout out. I mean, that that takes a lot of heart. And I don't think people appreciate how much energy and everything that it takes and compassion. And so I just I really I just want to say thank you for what you do, because you're obviously a loving, compassionate soul. And that makes a difference in those in people's lives. And I know it does. Um, cause a lot of times people, when they kind of get out of the circle, they, they're glad to shut the door and just push paper a little bit. So anyway, so grateful for that. So Chip, do you mind if we kind of transition and then just tell us a little bit, how'd you get hooked up with Eva's and it, whatever you're comfortable with, what, what was going on and what, what happened? So I was introduced to Eva's back in 2014. Um, I had just had my daughter. I have a six-year-old daughter. I got three kids, but I have a six-year-old daughter. Um, I was actively using drugs and I was kicked out of where I was living. I ended up homeless on the street once again. And um, I went to a 21-day treatment facility and they referred me to Eva's village. Um, And my first initial reaction was like, I don't want to stay in the same city that I'm getting high with. I don't want to be in a homeless shelter, even though I'm already homeless. You know, the, the lies you tell yourself. Right. Um, and I ended up coming over there. And when I came to Eva's village, it changed my life. Honestly, um, the, the service that, I mean, I, I was introduced to Mark layer who, 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 who runs the, um, the shelter, the men's shelter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and there's still people to this day that I keep in touch with, right. uh, whether it's bringing clothes for donation, whatever it might be. Um, but I started my process and, and what they helped me with, I mean, besides the groups, I met Angela in a group she says it in her, in her, in her uh, statement about the trust. I didn't trust anybody. Um, I didn't trust Angela. I'll tell you that much when I first met her and she, I didn't say anything in the group really. And she picked me apart in about 30 seconds. And she said, this is why you're trying to fill a void by doing X, Y, and Z. And I, and it it perked my ears up to listen. And we started working very close one-on-one together. And I started gaining a trust for, you know, and, and while I was here, uh, you know, they offer a culinary school, you know, yeah. I was able to obtain a culinary degree. I was able to attain apartment um, mm-hmm. through TRA. Um, my, you know, certain things I didn't have when, when you're on the street, you don't keep your driver's license and your social security and birth certificate, you know. Yeah. Um, but they gave me a lot of tools to utilize in order to get my life back on track. Uh, unfortunately, when I left, I didn't utilize those tools and I ended up relapsing and I ended up yeah. opening up another Dyfus case. Um, and years later, uh, maybe, you know, I always kept in touch with Angela, whether I was in jail, whether I was, um, in a different treatment center, I always kept in touch with Angela. She always, you know, she was my go-to my first phone call for anything. And, uh, you know, when I came back around, um, I was just willing, you know, I was willing to do the work this time. I saw that I had put certain things ahead of my recovery, like, um, you know, materialistic things that all my priorities were, were shifted off. And, uh, you know, when I came through this time around, uh, everybody welcomed me with open arms and, and I just took the advice and I started um, putting in the footwork that I needed to do. And I stopped with the materialistic things and the women and, and I focused on myself and, and what I needed to do, you know. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, even when I left here, it's, been, it's it'll be three years coming up on, on October 7th. And even when I left here, um, I still would come to see Angela. Uh, I would go to, there's a recovery center uh, where the outpatient services, it's also like a, a drop-in. Right. I would come cause I need to hear her voice and she needs to give me advice. And uh, I mean, you want to talk about making a connection when, when I got married, October 25th, I got to get that right. Yeah. October, 25th, <laughs> October 25th last year. Um, it was a small courthouse wedding, but I'll tell you who one of the first people on that list was. Right. It was Angela. Right. And everybody understood. Yeah, of course she'll be there. And she was there, you know, her, uh, Eric Spann, you know, all, yeah. work all, clothes on and everything. Yeah. yeah work right. clothes on straight from work. Did you, you, know, you wear the vest? Were you wearing the vest? <laughs> Not the vest. <laughs> she didn't wear the vest. She didn't wear the vest. Uh, 
<laughs> but uh, you know, Eva's continues, you know, and that's why I always give back. Me and Angela had did a, a um, we spoke at a lawyer's banquet dinner. Yeah. yeah. Anytime that she gives me an opportunity, especially when it's both of us, yeah. um, it's a great opportunity. I'll well, always give back. Well, let me, you know, <clears throat> so part of recovery, at least my experience being in groups with people is that the initial stuff starts, it, you, you tend to initially hate the person who's holding the mirror for you. Right. Cause yes. you, you don't want to, you don't want to see it so close. You know what I mean? So all of a sudden that like you're seeing all this shit that you've been hiding from mm-hmm. and running from and denying for all these years. And then you, that you break that down. And so then you're not fighting it anymore. Then you look at it and then you start to do the real work of recovery. Right. And then we, you know, this just, again, people, then we, we turn to start loving the person who's holding the mirror because then we appreciate the recovery process. And then once you're there, right. It's like, man, you high five and you thank you so much for, and then keep the mirror up because I know I have a tendency to hide some shit. Right. Yeah. And you yeah. know, and it's all about keeping that p- clear picture and keeping a clear head so you can kind of see that. So that's a great story. So thank you so much for sharing those components and congratulations. You got three years sobriety then I, I'm guessing or somewhere in there. Yeah. Uh, October 7th. We'll that's right. Yeah. Years. Okay. Well, congratulations. congratulations. And, and I just, you know, cause yeah, I, I know people get so frustrated with recovery and all that kind of stuff. If you've never been in that cycle and never been with people, I still remember one of the last days, you know, I, I worked for about nine years with probation and parole. We had recovery and did all that stuff. And I had a guy, he had gone through, I think, 17 groups, you know, residentials, all that kind of stuff. And I had to stand in front of a judge and argue why he should get one more opportunity. But anyway, so the 18th or 9th, whatever it was. And so, and then when I was leaving, uh, he had called because he'd heard I'd leave and he had six years of sobriety in after, you know, like 19 tries, you know, and he was like 48 or going on 50, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And it just, you know, sometimes just when you're ready, you're ready. And finally it all sinks in and you're tired of going through it. So, well, <clears throat> all very good. So I'm sorry, Emma, we're kind of just having a chat no, over I'm, here. So, you, great. <laughs> so, well, let me then shift over. So Emma, we read the piece. So I want to tie it into the giant stuff that's going on. So we had Evan Ingram on just, you know, the people have just watched Evan. He did a great job talking about Eva's and the mentoring program, he really focused on kind of the things he's learned about mental health and just that was a new area for him. So uh, whatever training you guys have been doing is really good. But there was a quote in the press release about the mentoring program that I just like Emma's going to read that. And I just like you to talk a little bit. And then Chip, you've already talked about that. But this notion about connecting and building relationship and the foundation, and the role of trust in kind of recovery. So anyway, give us a shot. Yeah, please. So this is from Angela. Incredible words. Uh, Most of Eva's residents and clients have never learned to trust anyone. They grew up without love or encouragement from a teacher, a parent, or a relative. Most have experienced childhood trauma, neglect, abuse, and violence. Some never met their fathers. Others had parents who were incarcerated, suffered from mental illness or addiction, or died of overdose. Learning to trust is an important step towards healing. Many of Eva's clients learned to trust for the first time at Eva's, supported by our counselors and others receiving from similar trauma or recovering from similar trauma. So let me just, so you guys just have a conversation a little bit about trust. And then, um, Angela, the other piece that we kind of talked about was some of the obstacles that you guys have identified. And, you know, and I just, you know, but as you talk about trust, how does trust overcome some of the obstacles and barriers that you've seen for people either staying out of the criminal justice system or being successful in recovery? So, but talk to us a little bit about that trust component, how Eva's works and builds that, how the mentoring program with the giants maybe fits in that kind of piece. Right. That's, that's the most important aspect of the work that we do at Eva's is being, is having the ability to connect and engage and build that trust. Because without trust, a person is not gonna heal. They have to, and I tell them when they come in, they have to at least begin to trust at least one person and the rest will come. Okay, wait. The rest will come. Let me just tag this while you're going, because what you said, they have to learn to trust in order to heal. Now, we've been talking about recovery, right? And I mean, I get this, but I'm just pointing it out because you and I, all three of us and four probably know this is true because recovery is a lot more about healing. Yes. A bunch of stuff because yes. it's hard to go forward if you haven't taken care of the past. So just tie us in as you're talking about this, you know, explain a little bit more about healing and the role of trust in that too, because it, it's it's twofold. Okay. 
So when clients, I, I can tell you how I begin our process of trusting over in the program where I am. When clients come in and they struggle with trust, I challenge their rational beliefs. In all reality, it isn't that they don't, they struggle with trust. They have been trusting the wrong things and the wrong people. Because in order to use drugs, you had to trust someone to go get it. In order to do certain things, you had to trust that in order to do it. So it was the wrong things that let them down that has put a barrier up. So when something good comes along, they become a little resistant towards it. So I tell them, you give, I take, well, Miss Angela, how do we trust? I tell you what, you trust me until I give you a reason not to trust you. Let me in. Yeah. And then if I give you a reason not to trust me, right. put me to the wayside as well. Right. So that's okay. how we begin. Yep. And once I get, but you know, they're still a little resistant at first because they're used to it. But however, I continue to talk to them because it's a lot of brokenness. Yep. It's a lot of hurt. It's a lot of um, betrayal. A lot of, when I say not trusting, you have a lot of people that come from broken homes. Um, your mother and your father are the first people that you trust. And if your mother, your father let you down, it sets the precedence for everyone else to be um, called suspect. It gives you an inability if you have broken home and a broken environment. It gives you an inability to connect in a healthy manner to, with other people. You learn to survive. A lot of times people learn to survive at a young age on their own because they don't have the foundation and the structure that's needed and what we call a normal family. So with all this together, a lot of times it, it, um, some of the clients that I have had the pleasure of working with, um, never, ages seven, eight, nine, learned to become men at ages seven, eight, nine, ten. So when they come to me, they're men in age. Yeah, but. But they're in survival mode. Right. So we teach them to learn to begin to live. It's an innocent difference between surviving and living. No doubt. Yeah. You know, living is when you have a purpose. Surviving is when you're just existing. Right. So it's you know, the work is fulfilling, rewarding, but it's needed. And we talk about trust. It doesn't stop because treatment is over. I go and a couple of other staff here that I know go above and beyond. And we continue after the fact because we are part of the, of the support system. And a lot of times when the support system is stunted or have stopped, a person, even though we teach them to build a um, healthy relationship, establish healthy relationships with others, we still become a major part of that support system. So we continue to do check-ins and, and call them and ensure that everything is all right, even after treatment is over. Yeah, which gives them a nice balance between kind of accountability as well as support that they know somebody's yeah. in the corner there. So, mm -hmm. all right. So, um, can we just, uh, and I don't mean, cause we could go on for this for a little bit cause I know there's a lot there, but, um, yeah. talk to us a little bit then about the giants mentoring program and what you guys hope to accomplish with that. How's that? What's going on with that? I'm so excited about that. <laughs> I'm so excited. Okay. About we don't have that. a giants Jersey yet. So we put George on the task. Of he's, he's supposed to come after this week. He's supposed to get two. He's supposed he's, to get, says he's going to get Evans and Levine. Yeah, so, so we'll hopefully have, we'll have a little we'll bit more blue up jury, here. Jury, 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 uh, Jersey trade after the game. So we'll okay. see. And, and before we start, I just want to say on record, Evan is not my fault that you didn't have a vest. If you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So, the mentorship program, the Giants have been affiliated with EVAS for about three decades, yes, I believe. Yes. And they have all, I have met them in the past from um, serving in the soup kitchen and things like that. They've always been affiliated. So the mentorship program came about and, and someone had spoke to me about it. And I thought it would be a terrific idea because it would give, um, our clients, uh, something to look forward to, first of all, but second of all, um, our hopes is it will be a catalyst to change, whereas though it would expand a vision to think outside the box because they're connecting with something out of the norm. Right. So it has developed. We are ready to go with it. We have a meet and greet scheduled for Tuesday the 23rd at nine o'clock, where through a Zoom call, we have the clients, the selected clients who are 
who does have legal involvement, who are attending our treatment program, outpatient, outpatient 20 Jackson Street, where I am. Yep. And um, the selected Giants players and the coaches are going to be on the Zoom as well, from what I understand. Wow. So the clients, of course, are excited. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Yep. Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, right. Yes, That's yes, cool. yes. That's yes. Cool. So it's, it's we're looking forward to it. So it's That's supposed cool. to take off this this Tuesday, in fact. That's this really week. cool. Yeah. And I just, and I, the work that I had done was all about around mentoring and taking, you know, pro social positive adults willing to just get to know people, have a relationship and build that trust. Like you said, yes. so, well, that's good. Yes. And I'll just say Evan was really moved. I think he has by just the kind of openness about Eva's accepting those guys and then all the things that he's learned, you know, and you know, he was great on the show too. Talked about his own vulnerability. You know, he said, you know, it's it, the weird thing about mentoring. He said a little bit is that we go in and, you know, everything, we're the NFL guy, we're supposed to have our act together, and, you know, I have all this stuff, and he goes, really what it does is, like, you see how similar you are in, yes. in ways to the people yes. you're working with, and the draw is kind of that common humanity that we share, and, like, look, man, every day I get up, it's a struggle some days, too, you know, I'm and like, my life is really good, he's all blessed and all that kind of stuff, but still, there are hard things that we all deal with, and so the, the ability to share that on a human-to-human -human level so he was certainly kind of seeing all that and really was feeling it. So I'm really excited. Maybe we'll get an update later in the year about that. So, okay, uh, let's see. We got mentoring with Giants. Last thing then, I just, you know, as we're going, um, we talked about some of the obstacles maybe that people face. And uh, I, I don't know, are there broad brush kind of systemic issues? So now just thinking about people that might be watching this, the ultimate question I want to ask is how can people help Eva's, you know, obviously probably volunteer and send money. You know, those are two big ones, right, but, uh, right. but are there policy issues going on? Are there systemic things that people could just have a greater awareness of that you'd like to at least mention as we're kind of wrapping up? I think the major, um, I think the major thing people can do to assist with everything that's going on is educate themselves. Understand that addiction is a disease of the brain understand that everyone is one unhealthy decision away from their life turning into something similar to this. I think uh, Eva's have a website that, that, that um, you can go on and you can retrieve information about the debt and debt um, programs and, and causes and purposes that we have going on over here. But the main thing is not run away from it, not shy away from it, um, embrace it. Let's get together. It takes a village. I always use that yeah. phrase. It takes a village because it does. Yeah. And um, just understand people are people. People are people. And the people who uh, struggle with opiate use disorder are just regular people who had an inability to cope in a healthy manner. Yeah. And as a result, their life just, you know, went left. So I think education, education is the key. I think community involvement, um, show up to the community events. Um, yeah. Right. So anyway, and I just, um, just, I just listened to a great podcast, uh, Aaron Brockovich, you know, the, the, the lawyer, the show came out in the nineties and all that, but her big theme, she just had a book out and no free plugs and all that. But one thing she talked about was we, the people, <laughs> We the people. We give you know, away the most shout outs. Yeah, I know we do. Well, we don't have any sponsors yet, so we're just kind of doing this. But anyway, she just wrote a great book that Superman's not coming, right? And it's up oh, to wow. us. It's it's up to us, right? There, there's no magic. Right. There's no miracle one coming, right? So if you look out the window and what you see in your community is not what you want, don't pull the shutters. Open the door. That's right. Walk yeah. out. Meet your neighbor, shake hands, say, what's going on yeah. with you? And then the two of you go across the street and meet two more neighbors and we can take this thing back, right? Yes. Because it's up to us. There's no, there's no cavalry coming. There's nobody, you know, shooting in to save everything, you know, and it's up to us. And so I really appreciate what you said. Just like get involved, get educated. And, I'm, you know, and I'm just going to put it on your words, but mine, you know, let's live with some kind of humanity, some compassion, some understanding, kindness, and lead with love and a little bit less judgment and see where it might all take us. So we can kind of go with that. So, um, Chip, we were kind of bogarting that over there with Angela. Anything you want to add toward the end? We're just, because we, we got a, a little bit of a time commitment. My director's kicking me in the leg. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, um, 
It's just an honor to, you know, whenever, whenever it's like be able to get back to Eva's or whatever, be doing a commitment with Angela, like it's such an honor, you know what I mean? Especially like when she told me a few weeks ago, whatever it was, you know, the New York Giants, it's mm-hmm. like, if you saw my household right now, I'm one team away from having the, the, the NFC East. I got a daughter that likes the, the Eagles. <laughs> Uh, I got a, a wife that's a Cowboys fan, oh um, and it's like I'm a diehard Giants fan. We're Great. we're one we're one team away. We get Washington. My baby girl likes Washington, and we got the division east. There going you go. My house. Perfect. But uh, no, you know it's it's listen this program and and just in general like being aware. You know, like um, the one thing that I learned and she had touched on it a little bit, um, or maybe we were speaking about it before, is like you know people think. Um, It could be any person can get addicted to drugs. You don't have to be black. You don't have to be white. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to be poor. And I feel like what I've learned throughout this whole experience, uh, because listen, I've been to treatment centers since I was 18 years old. I'm 35 now. Um, And and they didn't stick, but this happened to stick, you know? And I think it was learning that, you know, drugs really wasn't my main problem. Uh, It was the way that I cope with things like you were saying, um, issues that I have. And once I started to attack that, um, you know, it just opened up the doors. You were talking about like holding the mirror. Yeah. At first you're going to hate the person that's holding the mirror at you. You don't want to take a look at at yourself for what you really are at that time, you know, but making that change is just the most rewarding feeling in the world. You know, it's like uh, my life today from what it was from living on the streets and abandoned buildings and going through that to like, uh, you know, today, you know, happily married, three kids looking to buy a house, a, a job in the labor union, like this, this never seemed possible. Yeah. It's, it, it, when they talk about like, um, you know, uh, a life beyond your wildest dreams, like that's what these services, that's what this program, yes. that's that's what you gain from it. Because yes. I remember sitting in an abandoned building thinking, I'm never going to get my daughter back. I'm never going to change, right. you know, and the man that you see before you today is not the man three right. years ago, you know. Um, but so, here, wait, though, you know what, though, you are that man. You are, you're, you're different, but that was still Howard. That was still chip. And you know, that's the beauty of it, right? That like, we're not going to throw people away. Like we believe in the power of people and that everybody has a potential for growth, for learning, for change. And so, you know, I know exactly what you mean by that, but on the other hand too, you're still that guy. You still have that same DNA, but you've, you were willing to do the work. You, you looked at yourself hard, you got help and people were there to support you. And now you're living the life really of your dreams. It's, it's unbelievable. It's a great, great story. So, all right. So thanks to everybody. So I got to, I've just totally taken over this conversation. We usually are very fair about the question. So I don't know. Any- no, it's great. I, I just want to say the uh, thing that keeps coming up for me is not being afraid to talk about what's going on in your life. And I think that providing, I mean, Angela, you seem to be a, uh, a very strong mirror in people's lives. And so calling people out and being able to just cut through the, tr- I guess not really the bullshit, but cut through, yeah, cut through the bullshit and use truth to wake right. people up. Um, with that love, is, with love. That is a with superpower. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. And I think truth is such a, it can be very hard, but it's what people need to heal. And so uh, talking about it is very, very powerful and putting words to it. And then also just not being afraid to do the work and taking for I think it's really important to appreciate every day, the little steps. We always, we're big mountain climbers. And so we always talk about just one foot in front of the other. And no matter what it is, what your dream is, what your goal is, what your recovery process is, is it doesn't matter how tiny the steps are, as long as you have clear sights on that vision and where you're going. And so, um, y'all, that was interesting. Really quick, really quick. Oh, you're good. You're good. I wanted to touch bases on the pandemic. Yeah. COVID. On because we were already dealing with the opioid crisis, right. you know, um, it, the opioid, um, um, really the opioid use really got really bad with the prescription medications and non-prescription, um, opioid medications with had been, um, resulting in a lot of fatalities, a lot of, of dependencies and everything like that. But however, since this pandemic, this is why I love places like Eva's and Eva's Villas in particularly, because we weathered the storm, but we took a tremendous hit during this pandemic. Right. And we always served people in our kitchens that are homeless and things like that. And this pandemic has really, really taken a toll on the community. Yeah. 
uh, overdoses are highest that I've ever, I've spoken about it with parole officers and probation officers. We are losing so many people. There are so many people that are in lines now for food, for clothing, for I, I give out I try to give out masks even to when I see people with their kids yep. and this pandemic is just when you when you speak about the obstacles and the barriers the toll that this the impact that it has had on the community especially here in Patterson I can only speak for Patterson but this is where yep. work and this is where I do a lot of community things right it's, it's really severe and it's really horrific. And I thank God, I thank God that Eva's uh, is still weathering the storm. Um, we do have, you know, you guys talked about GoFundMe and things like that. Eva's is a nonprofit organization that's ran on donations. Right. And the donations is what keep us surviving in order to be of help for people like Chip and people out in the community. And I just wanted to make that known that, like, we really, we really, you know, in order to stay afloat, like, we really all have to, like, pull it together and and, and do more because it's Chip like, in. it's, it's <laughs> well, yeah. so on that, so, and I, I know the Giants have a, uh, I think they got a $10,000 match. And so the players are kicking in that amount. Right. And then the NFL has promised to match it. And so, um, George and the family, we are donating to the players match. So we'll do that contribution between now and Sunday. And then hopefully that'll make sure that the NFL has to pony up because those boys, are they, they got a little dough over the top there. So we're going to, we'll do everything we can with that. And we would just encourage people, if you're watching. We have all the links for the donation yes, in the show notes. Every, we'll have everything linked. Everything will be up there on the, on our website at Thunderbird Performance. And just, you know, if, if you're listening to this from Missouri, you know, if it's not Eva's, but look locally and find something, but the nonprofits and the work that the nonprofits do as kind of a fabric of our community and the people that they help and keep everything going is unbelievable. And particularly with COVID because our first show, we did a food bank out in San Jose and they typically for years had averaged around 200 to 250,000 meals per month. And after COVID they were over 500,000 and yes. the, here's the here. And this was what was really news to them over 60% of the client base were brand new people. They'd never gotten services before. That's how many people are close to the edge. So you, you know, you get laid off cause you know, this stops and that, then you lose your housing and now you're homeless and you don't have food. And so 60% of their client base now were people that were first time users of any kind of food bank or social services. So there's a lot of people there kind of right on the edge and COVID pushed a lot of people over. So we will uh, certainly do that. All the links will be up there. So I just want to say thank you for the work that you do. Angela, you're, like I said, you guys are the hidden pearls and uh, appreciate all the work, your heart, your love and compassion for everybody. Chip, congratulations. Thank so glad much. to hear your story. It's great. And so we just got to keep believing in those possibilities. And so we're very, very grateful. Director, she's my. She's giving me the good. We're excited. Oh, we're good. I mean, okay. this was this was so great. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. So this will get posted uh, Saturday. Sat Saturday, sometime afternoon, or so, somewhere in there. We usually post the day before the game, so everybody thing on will be on there. So you, you guys take care of yourself. And um, I'm sorry, is your philanthropist still there? Is she still watching us? Marie, yes. tell her. Get, <laughs> Marie, come around the picture. Hi, Marie. Come on, get in, get in, get in. <laughs> okay. All right. She, there we you go. Guys, thanks very much for this opportunity. This is amazing. All Thank right. you, guys. We're so glad to do it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, good luck with everything, and we'll be following you guys. Okay, take care. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye. Wow. What an organization. Be connect connected to your community. Do stuff about it. Reach out to people. Do the work. And love. And love. And don't judge. And I think that's the thing that keeps coming up for me is like you have like people are so close to being on the edge. And whether it's they lose their internet connection or they lose a meal or they lose their job or they lose a relationship or like something weird happens that can completely become the tipping point for their life. So don't judge people. Wear a mask register to vote, be active in your community, and stick around for the Mindful Minute. It's a little longer. <laughs> like everything I but it's great. Anyway. Action. Mindful Minute. 
I, I very, I love that we're adding in these sections. Um, this one is, uh, very, very close to my heart, um, just through yoga and meditation and all the, the journey that that has taken me on literally across the country. (laughs) It's been quite the journey, but, uh, for our mindful minute, the second part of our map program is controlled breath. Why don't you tell us about it, Pops? I will. So, uh, so we have an eight point path to mindfulness. So, uh, again, that I think it's on there, but I'm, I'll make sure it is this week. Uh, last week we talked about conscious awareness is kind of the on ramp, uh, and step two. And again, these are kind of circular not really linear, but anyway, we're going to work on them in an order. Uh, and the second one is controlled breath. So the point about the controlled breath is that, um, it, it develops mindfulness through practice. And what I mean by that is that when we are able to practice controlling our breath, that is the ins and the outs, how long we take and aware of our breath. Uh, last week I talked to you about uh, George Mumford and he, he calls it AOB uh, and that is awareness of breath. And I think that's what we're really focusing on. So it creates the ability to transcend and control our responses. So we talked last week a little bit about the distance between stimulus and response because we don't want to just react. And so when we use our breath, when life events happen and we can create that distance in between those things, it gives us an opportunity to acknowledge, review, and become aware of our thoughts and our emotions. And then within that time delay between that and when we respond, instead of reacting, we can choose our responses. So, and that's what the whole practice is about. So we practice this in meditation and or other ways. You can do it in a lot of different kind of ways. And when you practice it and you develop that skill, then it transfers over. And so those of you who are athletes, and that's what our MAP program is all about, this gives you the opportunity. So when you practice it and you're aware of your breath and you can control your breath, then you can do that in situations where there's stress. And so who doesn't want to perform better when you're under stressful situations? Everybody, because that's when it really counts. And so by the awareness of breath and being able to control your breath, you connect to your mind and you control your mind and your thoughts and your emotions and you connect to your body. So we're going to talk about all those things a little bit more. But again, so today the focus is on controlled breath, which does those things for us. And then when we are in control, our body will perform for us in a way led by our mind and breath that we want at the highest level. So the exercise action, last week I gave you an action step. We talked about a visualization, asked you to write them out as affirmations. I am, we are, and Mother Earth is. So hopefully you wrote out those affirmations and did some visualization. I encourage you this week when we talk about controlled breath, we're going to do just a little exercise. So Emma calls this kind of the four square box and it was kind of a box state, breathing, box breathing. So, and the only, I've changed it just a tad bit, but anyway, basically what we talk about is taking a in breath for four counts, nice and slow and easy. So you count in one, two, three, four as you're inhaling. I like to hold at the top for a couple. So you just kind of hold it easy, relaxed and then exhale. And I like to exhale for five. I like to exhale a little longer oh. on the way down because I think that gives it just a little bit of depth. So I like to So go, is this a, like, what, what shape is this? Is it called a trapezoid? It's, uh, yeah, it's a little, yeah. The, <laughs> the downside on one, it's not a full square. So, but anyway, so I like to in breath for four, hold for two, five down, and then hold two at the bottom and then repeat. And so I would just encourage you, if you haven't done a lot of breath work, to give that a shot. And uh, you can do that as part of your visualizations and or just do it before you do your visualizations. So just give that a shot. And if you just want to go four and four on both sides, that's okay too. I'll let it go for whatever you want. But be aware of your breath. And so if you're out of breath, control it. Relax. Take a breath. Get centered. And you take control. That's the Mindful Minute for this week. Anything else, Em? I always have something to say. She he does. always tries to wrap it up before I have something to say. Like, I don't <laughs> even know why he do this. Well, All right. He's just so mindful. He's in it. Um, I am now a pretty chill person. I didn't always. I used to not be. Um, but now I am. And I used to believe that going into any situation, I could just handle it. And, you know, being an athlete and whatever, like I knew that you had to practice and do certain things, but I never had the concept around 
um, controlling your emotion and your energy and the like anticipation or the anxiety or the depression or any of those other like very heavy emotions that go into a certain situation. So let's think about like going into a job interview or if you have to have a hard conversation with your friend. I literally just had one of those last week and it's like the anxiety, like just the sheer weight of a situation going into a single conversation. Um, Those things are very, very real. And I think it's really important to not only like uh, put a name to them, but also talk about them during this pandemic. And, um, I used to think that things would just be fine and work out. But, uh, as I went through them and botched them all and had really terrible experiences, I realized that there had, I realized like the importance of the prep work and the mental preparation that went into it and seeing, you know, now on the other side of it, it's like, you can't, if I can't control my breath and my emotions and my energy when I am in the most calm state if I can't focus my mind on a single point for more than a minute when I am alone in a room when it's dark when I have my like when I am chilling how am I supposed to control my mind and my emotions when I am in a very serious situation when I'm having that hard conversation with someone like how am I supposed to show up and be real and authentic and transparent and truthful with somebody if I can't be that way to myself when I am on my own And it took a lot of meditation and a lot of tears and a lot of, uh, a lot of time looking in the mirror and asking and really journaling. I mean, I say looking in the mirror, but like my mirror has always been my journal and I write all the time. Um, and I think it is insanely important that if you are struggling with situations when you are with other people or with you if you're in like a work situation or a social situation or a family situation and you feel like your energy is like all over the place and like you fluctuate and like I I mean I know those feelings like when your heart starts really beating and stuff if you feel like you're kind of out of control in those situations practice this breath trapezoid breath I I like to do the box breath I like to do and there's a really special mantra you guys if you're on Spotify or Apple it's called Kirtan Kriya K-I-R-T-I-N uh, space K R I Y A. It's a Kundalini meditation. This thing has changed my life and I am not, I'm not joking around at all. This meditation has changed my life and it has a four count rhythm and it's the mantra. It's sa ta na ma. So sat nam means truth is my identity. So the breakdown is sa ta na ma, but you go through a four count. So the great thing, and I've always wanted to make YouTube videos about this, but I haven't yet. So now we're going to do it. Um, <sighs> But it's, if you're like, for me, I loved yoga because it was a really physical practice. We're going way longer than I meant to, but I, I'm, I'm on this right now. So, okay, we're good. <laughs> but okay. for yoga, it always became this like physical practice for me. And it wasn't until I found this mantra and this meditation that it helped become something more to me instead. And so when you have satanama, right. And if you're watching the video, if you're listening to this on the podcast, I'm doing a mudra uh, finger placement thingy so watch the video youtube's great (laughs) um but the combination of the breath the mudra the hand thing and the mantra all were enough to focus on to help my mind shut down for a minute and it wasn't until all those things compiled and put it together so Um, if you guys, I'm going to stop talking about this, but, uh, if if, I'm so passionate about this because this mantra, this meditation, I swear changed my life. And, um, if you are feeling like you need some mental clarity and you need to just chill your nervous system out for a bit, this is it. And I will post this in the show notes because it is all the things, um, mindful minute (laughs) y'all. Um, so Thank you. And that's, uh, it's a career that, I mean, I, that's a great one. So I love it as well. And uh, I would certainly do that. But I guess what I would really like to stress with folks is you got to practice this stuff when it's safe and you're not under stress so that when you are under stress, you can perform in the way you want. That's really the point. And so master your breath uh, when it's quiet and solo and in those settings, and then you can transfer that over. And then you have the skill set in order to apply it in those situations where life gets really rugged. And we all know that that happens to all of us. So there you go. So mindful minute. Thank you. Also, 
This is the same meditation and the mantra that I teach to NFL athletes when we do yoga. So if it works for them, if it works for George Kittle right before he steps on the field ready to take this, then please do not brush this under the rug. Like there are mental cues, there are physical cues, there are things you can do to change your energy and to control your state. And so this is a tool, like yoga is a tool in your tool belt to mental health, to physical health, to emotional health, to spiritual health. And we use this on a daily basis. Like people ask how George is chill and happy and has fun when he goes out and plays. This is it. He does the practice. Yeah. Okay. Yogis. Mindful minute. Mindful minute. All right. So anyway, uh, coming up next. Ask George. Um, and so to be asking the questions, we have a very, very special guest. Claire. Oh, the crowd's going wild. Hey. All right. Here she is. Here she is. Everything. Everything. I'm out. Hey, honey. Hi, babe. What's up, girl? How do I do this? Oh, you look right, Ooh. child. I have bean, too. Oh, here we go. What? Oh, we gotta One, lift her up big. Two, Ready? Three. Oh, there we go. Hi, Daddy. Hi, team. Hi. Ba -ba -ba -ba. <laughs> okay, she's here. Good job, BB. Hi. Dane's here too. I, I can't hey, watch him though. No. You're talk up near her. Oh. He's dense. Can we get a sound check, Claire? Testing, testing. One, two, three, four. Ooh. Oh. Hey. <laughs> All right, so as the special segment, uh, we actually had a bunch of entries, so thank you guys so much. We're only going to do a couple rapid-fire ones. Well, we'll see. Okay, uh, so this first question is from Danny Stewart, um, and I'm going to let Claire take this one away. Right here, baby. Um, Danny is from Australia. Oh, from hi. Um, his question is... Female. Danny's a girl. Oh, dear. Sorry, Danny. Thank you Her for question show. is, during this rough time our world is facing, what is something you just do for yourself? How do you switch off and make sure you are okay? Also, Danny is uh, from Australia, George. Very excited. I know. Maybe she'll... I learned this from my Nanda, punter. Nanda. That's what Mitch taught me. He said that's something I can't translate it for you. So if she knows what that is, please email us. Wait, will you do it one Thank more you, time? Danny. Yeah, you're a little glitchy. Do it again. I... I don't know, Danny. We're gonna need a. What if that's like an explicit? I don't know. It is explicit. Oh. What if that makes me in a good, in a good way? Naturally. <sighs> okay, so Permission. what are what's one thing that you have done to, for yourself? What, how do you make yourself a priority? How do I make myself a priority? Um, I mean, like like making alone time from yourself. Is that? Yeah, it says how do you switch off and make sure that you are okay. Um, well, like. Yes, everything in the outside world has been stressful. Um, I was actually kind of lucky because, you know, um, during the quarantine and everything, like I got to live at home with my my family, my wife, I had my dog, and then I had a gym. So sister, I really- you had a sister I, too. We, I said my family. Um, but I had a gym, so I didn't really have to leave and I didn't have to change too many things. Um, we were really lucky. Um, but, you know, in like being back in California, um, you know, definitely different. Everything's- very close and everything and um kind of for like what helps me just decompress and get away from everything is um just hanging out with my wife honestly hang out with claire um Great taking answer. our dog yeah, out, taking, hanging out answer. thank you darling. But hanging out with Dini, uh, my princess Dini. um she makes she makes my days awesome like i come home from work and she meets me at the door and tries to tackle me so that's really fun um it, i've peaked in that regard yeah, so, <laughs> uh, but other things You're I so like to cute. read, um, I like to read. Um, so that's one thing I do. I uh, hit the Norma tech boots. Book you just finished. Uh, I just finished uh, a halo book. I love sci-fi. Um, I like sci-fi books a lot, like mystery books, but it's finished. Uh, it's called halo silent storm. I'm on book two. Just read the first chapter last night. You know, I'm going to keep going to dive into that. I'm um, excited about it. Um, but other than that, like that's what I do for myself, and I play I play a ton of video games. You do, and I want to say something about that because uh, I at first did not understand. I was like, 
What? Are we going to talk about video games? Yeah, we're going to talk about video games. I did not get video games, and I thought they were such a cop out. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, you're just going to check out and whatever. Like, and Claire and I like playing board games. We like cooking. We like doing literally everything together that you can do together. You know, so why wouldn't George want to do that with us? Um, But as I have seen George evolve and go through the different transformations of from high school to well, literally every level of who you are now, but seeing you step into your NFL role and seeing like really hearing you talk about the mental side of the playbook and how much energy goes into preparing and being who George Kittle is, um, I now have a very, very different, and I'm being dead ass here respect for video games in the way that it helps you to like check out and I think that's something I mean I did not understand it at first but now I see how it really has helped your mental state and it also George always says it it's the way that he's been able to hang out with his friends and so during COVID like what a I mean listening to you guys is a ridiculous be hilarious it's pretty funny but also it's really cool because you are you both have such a tight friend group and I've seen it evolve and, you know, Claire, not quite so much on the video game side, but definitely George. And, um, if you want to touch on that a little bit or. Oh um, yeah. I, my best friend, well, the best man at my wedding, I, I, I see him like twice a year max. He's my best friend. So we play video games together like twice or three times a week. And that's how I get to talk to my friends. I have a really good friend on Xbox um, that I've never met in person, but he's one of my boys on video games. <laughs> that just, I think, yeah. Wilga, I think, I think everybody has Vom that. Vom Squad, friend. shout out Vom Squad. Like I said, video games, um, you know, they do, they help you decompress. Um, like when you're off the football field, you usually think about football because um, in football, you know, you have a lot of hard conversations. There are tough plays. Yes, there's always highlights, but, you know, there's, you're always going through something when it comes to football. Um, and so a way to get away from that that I've used is, you know, like I said, I like to hang out with my wife, I like to hang out with my dog, I read. Um, but playing video games is something I've done since I was a little kid. Like I grew up on video games um, and I was waiting for me to always hang out with my friends. And so now I can hang out with my best man who lives in Iowa. I can hang out with one of my buddies who lives in Texas. Um, I can play with my friends on other teams like Rob Tunyon. I get to play with him. He's in Green Bay. I only get to see him in the off season. Um, so just, it gives me an opportunity to hang out with all those guys. Um, and it's really fun for us. So, um, that is one thing I've always loved and I probably will always continue to love it no matter how much my wife urges me not to. Mm-hmm. Oh, come on. But I do. Come on now. I come on now. It ain't okay. like that. She, she, it supports me though. I hope this works. <laughs> On occasion. Okay. So our next question. I, I caught that. What? My whole phone just fell. Oh, good oh, job. Wow, you're an athlete. So next question is Thank from you. Kevin Betancourt. Um, Kevin is from Toronto. Hi, Kevin. Oh, hey, how you doing? Oh, hey eh? there, hey. Eh? So this is his question. Hit it, Claire. Oh, hey there from Toronto. George. <laughs> so, <laughs> Was that so good, babe? Oh, George, hey there. <laughs> George, I see you do a lot of Canadian accents in your mic'd up videos from the Niners website. What is the origin? Have you ever been up north, eh? A. Well, love your biggest fan north of the border. <laughs> Great question. We went up north together. Okay, so yeah, I'll answer that part first. The first time I ever left the country was to watch the Rams and Patriots Super Bowl in Toronto at a movie theater like yeah. complex. Um, me and my wife went up there. We flew up on Saturday night, went to the game the next day, ate a bunch of great food there. And then the next morning at 6 a.m., we were on our way back to uh, where we lived. And so that was a wild experience. Yeah. But um, really enjoyed Toronto. We went out to eat. Um, it was February and it was actually a beautiful day. There was probably like five to six inches on the ground, but it was kind of warm. It was beautiful. Mm-hmm. Went shopping, walked around. It was a beautiful city. So definitely need to come back to Canada. Yeah, we um, had fun. The origin, why why I do it is um, shout out to my guys at, uh, pardon my take, uh, Big Cat and PFT. They did a video several years ago in Canada and they're just wearing jorts and jean jackets and they talk in those Canadian oh, accents and the whole time they say, oh, hey there, how you doing, eh? And I thought it was just like the funniest thing. So I'm a huge uh, PNT guy. Um, and you're just good at it. No one else can do it. Can we get a little, for people who don't know, Georgie, could you uh, lay some Canadian accent on us? 
I I just did three times. No, I can't just. It's natural. Like I can't just force it on you guys. I'm sorry. It'll be back though. Eh, a yeah. little bit. Siri, eh? uh, Siri. Eh? <laughs> Uh, it, it also wrong. has it's funny. my favorite uh, when you say it. I love when you say it for National Tight End Day, but I just love National Tight End Day in general. Um, okay, rapid fire questions. Um, oh. This one is from Danielle Hernandez. Ooh, I like this one. Uh, how long is the hair going to be growing? Do you want to know what my answer was? Or I'll tell you. Yes. After. That wasn't a yes or no question. I said forever. Can we, uh, can forever. you do it off to the side so people can see your lip? Oh, well, this is Bruce's height. I know. Forever. forever. <laughs> <laughs> One more time, George. Forever. That was fabulous. Can we do it with Great a Canadian movie. accent? Very, I don't know how to do it. He's going to hit you. Um. All right. Do you agree with nice. that statement forever, or do you have a different comment? Yeah. Great. Well, you said it was going to be a yes or no question. I didn't get a yes or no question. That's fair. It's That's tough. Fair. It's um, tough. This one's from Reggie Gonzalez. Uh, Hi, Reggie. What are three things George Kittle cannot live without? One. One. Two. I'd say my wife. Um, Great answer. Actually, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna shorten. I'm gonna do my family okay. as number one. His sister. So then I can have it. So I can have a two and a three. Huge no, Deanie's in involved. Deanie's involved with that. Deanie's right at my um, ankles right now. Uh, two um, would be uh, delivery food. I couldn't live without it. Okay. Um, and um, let's see, three. I would say my friends. Oh, that's sweet. But delivery food might be number one, honestly. Yeah. Just saying. I'm about to get room delivery right now. I'm excited. What are you getting? I haven't decided yet. I have to order it as soon as I hang up the phone. Well, let us not keep you. All right. This one is from Lydia T. Do you like pineapple on pizza? She also adds, this is a serious question. I am on a mission to pull all 49ers players on this. Smiley face. I played the fifth. What? That's a real thing you can order. I know it is. Why don't you want to talk about pineapple? I don't want to burn any bridges with um, people. This is a touchy subject for a lot of individuals. I love pineapple on it. I used to get it all the time. I'm just going to tell you, George and I used to eat it all the time. <laughs> it was super. I love it. it, it it's fabulous. delicious. It's delicious. Yeah, it pretty but good. we love sweet stuff. Like the same way that people, like you love salty stuff. Mm -hmm. I love sweet stuff. What are you, George? Are you sweet yeah. or salty? I can't like he she loves like salt. salt on stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's Claire's a different level of salt. Oh my gosh. No, I'm I have a sweet tooth. But yeah, right. no, if I do like uh the Hawaiian, you know, some ham and pineapple, I'd crush it. It's not my first choice. Marty Taylor but I'm not gonna say no, I'm not gonna say no answer. to it. Right, same. It's not it's not the first choice, but if that's not even the second, but I enjoy it if it's there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm a pepperoni than a supreme guy, so mm -hmm. those are my two. Claire, what's your favorite pizza? Oh. Mozzarella. Well, Margarita. I love all pizza. I don't discriminate that, on the pizzas. Good for you, babe. I like an Italian pizza. <laughs> it the <Wow>. truth. <laughs> okay, so that was our first segment of Ask George. Thank you, everyone, for asking the questions. Um, this couldn't literally couldn't happen without y'all. Um, Georgie, any final words to your fans? Um, whoever has the best question after the end of five episodes gets a pair of game worn gloves. So better wow. ask a good question. That's huge. Get them in. Okay, I'm gonna actually post are this on our social media. The uh are you determining which is the best question or I determine okay. me. Okay. And that this episode will be included. And also, I, we had a lot more submissions, so we'll go through. Just because your question wasn't asked today does not mean that it is not in the round for um, best question of all time. Yeah. So what I'm saying is don't send the same question every time, please. Yeah, yeah don't do That's it. Also, question. one more thing. Get creative. One more thing. Yeah, what? one more thing. Um, if you guys can guess the number I'm thinking in my head, you also 
get a pair of game worn gloves. And I'm thinking of it. Give me one sec. Yeah, I don't want to guess that. All right, I got the number in my head. I'll tell the girls later. But if you don't, when you guys send in your questions. Oh, for the fans. Okay. Yeah, for the fans. If you can guess the number, I'm thinking of my head. Okay, literally as the tech side of this entire thing, my mind is racing on how the hell I'm going to actually get this to work. Okay, but also, George. Uh, they have to watch it on I'm YouTube. Just, you can't see I'm trying this, to make but her... look at our Oh, yeah, new look, I was, a, I was a double guest today. Letty. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we love you. We're just talking <sighs> now because I like guys. looking at your face. We love you. We're so proud of you. Um, uh, wow. <sighs> Emma, get out of here. I'm talking to my wife. <laughs> What's up, girl? Hi, baby. I miss you. All right, see you guys. Love you so much. All right, bye. Rated PG-13. Love you, bye. Love you. Letty Lake Chuga, little sister. Um, What a treat to have you on the podcast. Doesn't she look fabulous, you guys? I feel fabulous. (sighs) Feels fabulous, looks fabulous, sounds fabulous. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, we blessed. Um, Anything that you want to say to the Niner gang? Or the bang, bang, spot? Niner gang. Ooh, that's solid. Okay, well, we're going to go um, refill our glasses of tea and yes, have some tea. salad. Salad. Or beers and pizza, something like that. But um, all right, y'all. Thank you for watching. Um, this is another fabulous episode of the Hidden Pearls podcast. Thank you to Evan Ingram, Levine Toilola, Eva's Village, everybody. This episode doesn't come together without all of you. And even if he's not on camera right now, our dashing co-host BK. BK. all day all day um your whole vibe and <laughs> if anybody doesn't know our family uh bruce is actually a verb in our family so we call it brucing so yeah he brucing hard right now if we're not watching us so um we love you we love you george we love you jan yeah, let's go niners then go. come home for three home games Woo. Woo. october Woo. hey bye y'all <laughs>